Hi there, this is James Chai of Arf Bark Bark Rescue Foundation, and I am broadcasting to you uh, from my computer today, unfortunately, because my cell phone is not working very well, and I won't, uh, won't get internet access for some reason today, even though I'm right here in the same room with uh, my computer. And so I apologize. So the sound quality is going to be horrible. The quality of the video is going to be horrible. And um, people will be saying they can't hear what I'm saying. So I apologize. Uh, unfortunately, Facebook sucks today. Well, when does it not? I'm a little bit grumpy just because um, it's just not working. So I'm going to just try it as we're talking. And if I can get back on again, I will. I'm trying to, uh, oops, sorry. Well, that didn't help. I'm trying to get on here. Unfortunately, like I say, is, um, I'm not getting the internet connection on here. But today is October 20th, 2019, and this is episode number 26. Started on uh, September 24th. The thing stopped once or twice um, uh, to, to basically, um, uh, you know, take a day or two off, everything. And um, uh, I won't be able to see live comments unless I switch screens back and forth. And then even then, it's going to be kind of a bit of a, a bit of a hassle. So I apologize to people who are um, going to comment. If I do see them, it's going to be by luck because um, like I say, it's just, it's just not working. Um, and let me just see. Again. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not letting me uh, log in for some reason today. Okay, so I, uh, I hope I can see what's going on with everybody. If you are posting comments, I'm going to switch over and try to um, get into my other screen and you know back and forth yada yada and just see um so if comments do come up i apologize i probably won't catch them in time but i'll switch back and forth um which is kind of silly this facebook um app on on um on here it doesn't doesn't work to show comments which is kind of a drag and then so oh, okay now it's saying i have a yeah okay all right anyway right i'll i'll stop talking okay uh blah, 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 blah. Okay, so today um, I've got some some topics that I can talk about, uh, and if you guys just know, just some really basic stuff. But I'm going to get to uh, uh, one of my uh, members from my closed reactive dog group um, who asked me a question today from Sue Palmer, and um, so I'll try to get at that. It's going to take a little bit, um, and then we'll go on to the other stuff. But I'm going to talk about petting your dog's stitches and standing still with your dog. A couple of things I haven't been able to really flesh it out, uh, as I said. Unfortunately, just, let me just switch out here again. Um, I haven't been able really to do that just because uh, I was trying to get online, unfortunately, and um, you know, you know how it is. So let me just see. And there we go. Okay, cool. All right, right on. All right. Okay. So uh, oh, there we go again. So, why? Shout out, James. I am Brooklyn. Well, I'm really having trouble today. Uh, as I said, um, unfortunately, let me just switch up here again. Let's see. Um, I'm going to just turn the volume down. Okay. okay, so I might be able to see comments. I, I'm hoping I can see comments. Uh, like I said, is um, the the screen doesn't show it for some odd reason. So, um, okay, anyways. I'm having technical difficulty, and, and it's really quite frustrating, actually, today. Um, okay, so... All right. Okay. All right. Thanks everybody for bearing with me. So today I'm going to talk about a couple of things and I'm going to get to Sue Palmer's post. Uh, she posted it today asking for help. And as you know, I do provide free online blog training. Uh, just basically have to go to my website, arfarfbarkbark.com. Go to the tab free help for your dogs. And it'll show you screenshots of other conversations that I've had with people online where I'm reading their dog with, uh, you know, quite, quite astute accuracy and also there will be a link there where it will show where you can sign up to my group you just have to add on yourself to the group and i'll add you in and then you can post inside of it and go from there and there are lots of people that are in it at that are just there to see what is going on what's being said etc cetera, etc cetera. so this is actually i think uh dual posting at the same time hey rita oh so i see rita now okay so this is uh posting not only on my facebook page but also on my facebook uh closed group as well so Rita if you're there you'll be able to see it and see what's going on and then uh, upload everything to YouTube go on from there okay so um, getting back to the uh, today October 20th, 19, uh, 2019 episode 26 of my blog and it is about petting your dog stitches and standing still with your dog um, one of the things today is I had a group session 
uh, through Second Chance in Life uh, uh, down in Burnaby, Vancouver, British Columbia today. Okay, so it's in Burnaby. It's not Vancouver. It's Greater Vancouver. All right. Uh, and so I had a group session, and it's with people who have skittish dogs. And the question is, how do you um, get a dog that is skittish, that's afraid? And these dogs are coming in from Taiwan. And unfortunately, the level of cruelty in Taiwan is just pure apathy. It, it's just pretty gross. And a lot of the dogs, um, you know, people leave out traps, illegal traps. They leave it out there just so they can catch uh, dogs and, and or inflict cruelty as well. It's, it's a really horrific way that they deal with it there. Um, there's almost 2 million stray dogs in Taiwan. I have a Formosan Mountain Dog myself, Sammy, and I've showed her here before. She's only got two legs. She was hit by a car in Taiwan, and I saw her through um, one of my rescue uh, rescue um, contacts there. Notification, sorry, this is going to drive me nuts because it's itching my head, actually. Um, so <laughs> I feel like I'm 12 today. Just uh, I'm wearing like an oversized uh, sweatshirt to, or a uh, pullover just because it's chilly today. Um, so, yeah, it's a skittish dog. So um, they had uh, uh, have four dogs there. I usually just keep it to four dogs, nice and small. And the dogs have similar types of dysfunctions in the point of being skittish. And this is something that a lot of times people will try to give a dog you know, medication or treats, that medication to calm down the dog's anxiety, the, 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 the skittishness, etc. Or else, uh, first and foremost, they always try when they go to the trainer or uh, behaviorist is to give them treats. And unfortunately, that just doesn't really work out that well because when you have a dysfunction as a human being, if you have a dysfunction and something is wrong with you and you're not feeling well because of the stress in your life, the last thing you want to do is start eating food, uh, or, you know, comfort food or whatever it is. The last thing you want to do, you want to be able to be alert, sentient, and address the issues that are happening at all times. You don't want to be like, oh, well, I'm just going to fog out a bit. Maybe you, you – well, kind of relax when you're at home at the end of the night. You just want to take the edge off. You can smoke up, have a have a scotch, have a, have a beer, some wine, some red wine. Never white unless you're having fish. Um, so, uh, sorry, my head is just it's itching my head today. I don't know why. I'm like 12 years old today. Um, okay, so, oh, uh, yeah, there it is. It's just I, I would cut it off, but then that would just be something really dumb. Okay, so. Um, Oh gosh! Oh my gosh! Okay, just I might end up putting on a baseball cap or something like this, uh, and because I can't read. <laughs> okay, calm down, James. James, calm down. All right. Um, so I had a group session with the four dogs, and and a couple people uh, were there, uh, a really cute couple, and they were there with their dog, and um, it's kind of cool because I was in the parking lot, I ran a little bit behind, they were running behind, so I showed up when they were getting their dog out of the uh, uh, the vehicle. And it was just so adorable, this couple, because um, just they weren't so concerned about their own dog as much as they used to be. And I've worked with them before, or they've hired me before, and they weren't as concerned about their dog as they would normally be when I first met them a year ago. And they'd come to another group session just recently through Second Chance in Life as well. and. It was just really so nice. They were, they were like, they, they kind of had, because they had already learned a few things from me through, through private session and, and a group session. And they had learned some of the coping mechanisms for their dog and, and their new dog. And it was just really lovely. And then what was so adorable was one of them reached over to the other and just gave her a kiss, like that kind of nuzzling thing, uh, you know, and, and the humans, I mean, right? Not to the dog. <laughs> And it was just really gorgeous. It was just really, um, it was really cute. And I, I watched them both, right? And they were both walking down and they were just so happy, even though they knew their dog was skittish and everything. Um, this couple was just so happy. And, and, I, and I'm so delighted every time I see, uh, see them, see you guys, you know, um, uh, Susan and Sarah. I, I really just love seeing the two of you because you have this incredible amount of love that's between the two of you. And it's so gorgeous because it's just so visceral. And I want to tell you a little bit of a, a story. You know, when I was younger, my, my, my you know, 20s, 30s, um, uh, I was pursuing an acting career. And you can Google and stuff. I've had some, some, a few credits and all that stuff. But I could never do it. Just I was too self-conscious about what it was. And I was, I was nervous and insecure and everything like that. Couldn't really do it. But I remember one of the acting classes, uh, it was four months, uh, sorry, four weeks, four, you know, four classes. Sometimes it was eight classes, but it was twice a week. And um, I can't remember, uh, um, 
Nancy Sivak. Nancy Sivak. Um, she was considered as uh, one of, uh, well, BC's top actresses or actress, should I say, and one of the best in North, in Canada, for sure. Um, and she was actually, uh, I believe it was Al Pacino that actually asked her to go to LA and be her, his coach uh, a, a few years back. And she had said no, because in her mind as an artist, it was, it was a great thing. She said she didn't want to do that because uh, she would be abandoning her students, so to speak, um, in Vancouver, because she had classes and she would have to leave and, and go down there. And it was really an interesting, uh, an experience, uh, just the way how Nancy uh, is still is just so um, viscerally connected and organic, and really uh, her ethics are incredible. Her ethics are absolutely incredible. Uh, an incredible person. I think she teaches at Vancouver Film School now, or still, should I say, uh, an incredible asset if you ever come across anybody as well. And I learned uh, acting classes from her, and all that stuff becomes part of my life, right? And I talked before about doing stand up comedy and having a few of my own businesses and working corporate as well. So all these things kind of work inside of me. They, they help me develop an empathy. Uh, I took uh, Wing Chun, um, that uh, my Sifu Fred Kwok, he, he had gone to um, to the same school that Bruce Lee had learned uh, from as well. Yip Man wasn't alive anymore at the time, but he had learned there, uh, Fred, uh, my Sifu Fred had worked there, uh, sorry, uh, learned there and uh, uh, Sifu Kwok was one of the best in <laughs> in the world just phenomenal when he opened up his studio when he came here to Vancouver he opened up his studio and uh, the Chinese consular was there for the opening uh, Sifu Kwok had quite a few connections on both sides of uh, the border so to speak he was a uh, he was a very uh, well-established individual who could certainly defend himself amongst a group of people and uh, I've seen that happen. His aspect of behavior, uh, Nancy's aspect of behavior, um, is just a really beautiful thing. And it becomes all part of where I go to appreciate what goes on in my life. And um, you know, as I work towards changing myself, introversion and introspection on what I do. And um, one of the things I remember from Nancy's class was the empathy and, and the people that were in there. And so we had finished the class and we went out for something to drink, right? After class, you know, end of the class celebrations, et cetera. And so we were all there sitting there and there was a, um, there was a, uh, there's a woman uh, from the class and act, another actor, right? And we were sitting there, just um, everyone was talking and all that stuff. And I had noticed that she was watching this couple um, that were sitting there making goo goo eyes at each other. And it was a, a gay couple. And they were looking at each other and they were just so much, um, you know, enthralled in love with each other. And then I noticed her staring, right? This woman staring. And I was like, okay, that's kind of not cool. You're just, not only you're staring, you're probably going to say something ignorant. And I said, you know, and I, so I thought oh, I'd say something. I said, well, what are you doing? And she goes, oh, I, I'm just watching them. And I went, okay, so you're watching them, right? I'm just expecting something dumb to say because there's me being stupid. And so she says, I just love that. And I said, what? What do you mean? And she said, I love watching two people in love, that connection. And I was like, wow, that's just beautiful. There's me thinking that she was going to be, you know, making stupid comments. And um, there's me just making the assumptions, right? So I'm making the assumptions and stuff like that. And that's my own fault. And it just, I remember that resonating with me. And that changed the way I saw things slowly. It all, like tea being infused into, into a hot water. And it all kind of comes and becomes part of me, right? And people ask me, where did I learn all this stuff from? You know, when I was a kid, I wish I was like Bruce Lee, that I could change the world like Bruce Lee. And in, in a way, I am doing that with dogs, for sure. And I'm reading them as fast as Bruce Lee could move. I wish I could move that fast. And obviously, that's why I took Wing Chun and took acting as well and went to the change the world. Um, but seeing this couple today, uh, Susan and Sarah, it was just absolutely gorgeous how Sarah was doting somewhat you know, in public, but doting on, on, on Susan. And uh, I saw them walking and I just, I followed him. And normally I would have said, hey, how's it going, right? And all that and say, hey, is this your dog and so and so? And I just, I just enjoyed the journey. I enjoyed watching them as they walked and the way that just the energy and that connection, they were so conscious of each other. And it's exactly what I say to all my owners, uh, all my clients, all my, uh, even all, when I do pro bono over the video consults and all stuff, 
I just love watching people in love. I love the way people connect to each other. It's just an absolute gorgeous thing to see true love as an existence. And it carries over with the way that they are with their dog. And they have a couple of dogs. Um, and I just brought one today, uh, Lupin, which is just, it was just so gorgeous how they were just, all three of them were a family. You could just tell. It was just an absolutely beautiful thing. Uh, and, and it's about connecting, about connecting to each other. It's about connecting to your dog, treating them as they were your own child. Human child? No, of course not, but your own child. Because as I've been saying in the last few days, we're incredibly lucky, as even though we are apex predators and we have brute force dominion over everything in this earth, right? If it doesn't work out, we burn it down, we kill it, we, we, we take possession of it. Uh, you know, we fight through the legal system, et cetera, and all that stuff. But it's the connection that we have lost as we have evolved technologically. And, I, and I'm saying we are a, now a technological species. That's, that's our whole motivation. And where, where, where do scientists, theorists, uh, behavior, everybody, what are they saying what's gonna to happen to mankind, humankind? Is that eventually we're going to have artificial intelligence and then eventually we're going to figure out how to transfer consciousness into the computer and then we become a hybrid, which is I call a hybrid. Um, they're not calling that, right? But they're calling that um, human, downloading our brains like the matrix or whatever into the computer and then consciousness has to come out that way. And as we transition towards a hybrid species, um, what I call artificial intelligent being. So the first intelligence is going to be human intelligence, right? Biological intelligence, that's us. And then artificial intelligence is computers, that's second, second intelligence. And then third intelligence is going to be what I call again, artificial intelligent being a hybrid artificial and intelligence as in so forth yada yada and that, that's where we have the existence like I say I, some of the things i think about um and then we can extrapolate from there and that's where i started theorizing in regards to how our consciousness became about in regards to the logical emotional process and the default situation as we go on a quantum process of events and instinctively through a biological memory aspect of it um not trying to be smart or anything like that i'm just this is what I'm thinking about, okay? And I mean, I mean, we all do, but we're a technologically driven species. So as we move towards this aspect of computerizing our own existence, right? It's gonna happen. They're saying within about a hundred years from now that we should expect to see computers, artificial intelligence being given, afforded, I mean, afforded limited legal rights, which is kind of uh, like, wow, right? Because artificial intelligence, now you have the ability for the intelligence to work. And I think, I can't remember how many, like a thousand teraflops or something of processing per second is what the human brain does. And they finally have a computer that does that now. And somewhere in China, they have that as well. And the uh, Pentagon, I think, or somewhere is supposed to be making one here. Um, but are we going to be able to achieve and maintain emotional capacity? Because if you look at the fact that Computers, again, if this is a theory that computers will be artificial, AI, will be afforded limited legal rights, does that mean that animals, uh, dogs, are going to have that same achievement? We're not going to get that achievement unless we as a society find the way where we're able to recognize and prove that dogs have a sentient function. And I call it functional sentient being. How do we prove that? Well, the only way we're gonna prove that is by the definition of sentience, feeling, thinking, consideration, thought, even so far as much to say premeditation, which is a premeditation is only a human consequence. We're the only ones that, our species, we're the only one that goes out, okay, tomorrow at 7.34 p.m., I'm gonna go online and do a vlog tomorrow. Not one animal thinks that. Not one creature alive thinks this. And the thing is, you don't see scientists talking about this. And it's not saying I'm, I'm brilliant or anything. I'm not. I'm just like, it's just a really dumb, stupid statement on my end. It's like, we premeditate. And I talked about the other days about dogs being consequential. And, and they're not reactionary because they only do something due to the consequences of what happens. If something happens, then, okay, consequentially, they'll react. But they're not just reacting just because. They're just, if it happens, then they do it. So uh, I'm just talking about a bit more of an immediacy. And 
where's our emotional context on things as we as we kind of move away and and when we talk about our dogs we're not talking about our dog i mean like i, I said to them in the group as well and i said to everybody you know i'm pretty straightforward and some people sometimes people think i'm singling them out i'm not everyone gets everyone gets uh, uh singled out as part of it but it's about the emotional context and when i saw susan and sarah walking and the way they were with each other was amazing and and i said that to them i was like wow I'm just, like it's true love between you guys and with and their dogs and everything and it's kind of funny because we have come to a society where even expressing true love as i said dogs are overt codependent they just love to show how much they love us and everything else in the world and they're so happy the ones that are functional and humans were like no we don't want to show public displays of affection and so i said to the to them uh to this couple just love the fact how you guys are just in love with each other and how how sarah takes care of you and everything she goes oh well, well i hurt my you know my i fractured my wrist i fell down and fractured my wrist and all that stuff i was like yeah but look at the way she's taking care of you and it's so gorgeous and that transfers through to their dog and that's what keeps a healthy relationship um you know i, I mentioned the same thing uh, as well is that people are walking um uh, with the dogs, right? You know, I, I, I talked about the one couple that hired, uh, you know, Dr. Claudia Richter, uh, as well as Renee Erdman uh, from Bravo Dogs. And there's the, you know, prescription medications and all these kinds of things. And when they would go out, it was just, they were both on alert because their dog was reactive. And both the, uh, the, the couple, uh, the husband and wife, they were both on alert constantly. And they were both talking to each other. And this is just not this couple. This, Almost every couple that has a dog that's dangerous or reactive or aggressive, especially if it's human aggressive. And if, if they have a dog that's dog reactive, most people are like, okay, well, we'll cool, because they can say hi to people. But with other dogs, people who have dogs that are reactive, not just to dogs, excuse me, only, but dogs, but primarily humans, those people are very, very alert. And you don't see a lot of those people walking around during the daytime because they find off hours. And if you have a dog that's reactive or aggressive to humans, you know that yourself. Even if your dog's reactive to other dogs, okay, it's one thing, right? But if they're reactive to other dogs and you want to walk your dog around without a muzzle, you have to find off-peak times that nobody else is around. Or you got to drive yourself out 10, 15, 20, 30 kilometers, miles away so you can find, uh, you know, a... Uh, 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 a pass, a somewhere quiet where there's no human beings they can let your dog run around off leash etc etc because you run in that fear and if you have to walk the especially couples if you have to walk your reactive human reactive dog to people uh, around people they're always on alert and they're always tense and they're always carrying it upon themselves and when then of course as you're thinking when they're carrying it upon themselves their dog feels it and their dog feels not just the anxiety. They can hear the tone, the changes, and the shifts, and the tone of voice, and all that stuff. And then for the dog themselves, it's like, okay, uh, something's going on. Something's going on. And the couples start to somewhat, you know, have discussions, uh, passionate discussions with each other. And I always, say, <laughs> I always say to them, you know, let's just put that all in the past. I'm not involved. You know, I'm neutral. I'm just helping your dog. You, you two are not to your corners, but you two are just basically need to identify the fact that. We're now all working together. And um, uh, it's just super important, right? Because if, if not, then the dog is going to um, feel it and then people carry it home, right? They don't relax until they get home. And even when they do get home, they're still kind of like stressed out. Like, okay, what could I have done differently this time? Because uh, my dog tried to bite this one person that I thought I was taking care of. And it, it's really quite tough to, to do that because uh, it's a struggle for, for people, right? It's a struggle for, for humans to parent a dog that has potential to viciously hurt somebody. And as I've said before, every single dog is a predator. Every single dog has the capacity to kill, albeit a mouse uh, with a chihuahua or a, a, um, a large animal, as would a Great Dane be or some other aspect, right? And Great Danes were, were that, Great Danes go back to the times of the pyramids. They lived in with the pharaohs and all that stuff. And as they moved forward, then they were bred towards killing wild boar. And wild boar are very big animals. And then they would go out there and kill them. So they were quite vicious and all that stuff. And, and like I say, the only reason I'm talking about Great Danes, because I, I, I got flack from this before from other Great Dane owners, is the fact that I have a Great Dane. 
I have Great Danes, should I say, and they're all ones that I've adopted. I've never taken a puppy in. I just, it's just not for me. Um, I just don't have the patience for that, I guess. It's a different type of training. But all the, all the Danes are dangerous to predatorial. They've all either attacked uh, uh, dogs and other animals, but they have almost always attacked human beings. And so I know the tension that goes on. I know the potential of it all. I absolutely love the breed. So this is why I have them, but at the same time, I want to make sure that anybody think of getting a Great Dane, and I see the posts happen up in all these Great Dane groups. I thought Great Danes were great, but my dog is my my dog is doing this and this and this, and now I'm really worried. And the vet says my dog can't be fixed, and he has to be killed. So I just want to make sure that we I, we we prevent that. Great Danes are generally really beautiful, loving dogs. They're called the gentle giants. They're called the Apollo of dogs. They're a very popular breed in Europe because of the small size and low uh, small size of the apartments and the low activity aspect of it. When you have a dog that's happy and great, regardless of the breed, you're relaxed, right? You see the couples out there, they're hiking. I get to do all these kinds of things, but the couples that have that tension is, is where it's difficult with the reactive dog. The dog is skittish, like in the dogs in the group today too. It's still the same part because they're still worried for two reasons. One is, oh my gosh, my dog might react to somebody else's dog or human being if they try to pet them. And those people are always like walking with their dog like, okay, well, we can't let anyone pet our dog. We can't let them because it's going to make our dog really freaked out and then she's going to come home and she's going to be really all over the place. And then the other one is, oh my gosh, my dog is stressed out. My dog is super stressed out and I feel awful and you can see her freaked out and she's all scared and everything. And oh my gosh, I can't handle this. This is just too much. Dogs are able to sustain an elevated level of emotional um, uh, emotionality. As I've said before, you go to the shelter, you go see a dog that's behind a fenced yard, that's reactive, right? You get near the fence, the dog is barking at you. You could be there for 45 minutes and the dog is still going to go after you. You could be there for an hour and 10 minutes, the dog is going to be after you. Even though the dog is, an endur is not an endurance predator, they're a burst predator right these are my terms they're burst predator because they only go for short periods to be able to take something down they're not like the uh you know uh, i don't know what's an endurance predator maybe like a lion or something no, probably not a lion um but they're just they're, right they're, they're able to maintain an elevated in functional uh, emotionality our dogs are able to maintain that and then when they're dysfunctional and they're skittish and they're all freaked out and everything like that they're going to be continuing to be in that time that 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 emotionality right i hate calling me all emotional i want to say psychologically but i it, it, i'm going to get too complicated here today <laughs> so they're still like this when you even if you take your dog out for a 20 minute walk they're going to be they're going to be stressed anxious for 20 minutes take your dog out for for an hour dog's going to be stressed for an hour it's going to continue. It's going to happen. And even though the dog, uh, your dog is not showing it overtly, your dog is still going to show that stress inside because now they're holding it in. And they're pulling on the leash, right? A lot of people with a dog pulling on the leash constantly, pulling on the leash. You try to get them there. They're all over the darting all over the place. They're pulling on the leash. And you're just like, oh, my gosh, I wish I had a normal dog. For, your, for the dog on the leash that's skittish, your dog that's skittish, that's dysfunctional, that's normal to them. If it wasn't normal, when you take your dog out of the house, they would be like, hey, how's it going? Like, you know, I'm really happy. Instead, your dog is like, oh, gosh, I got to go outside, but I want to go with you. And people are like, oh, well, when I get the leash, the collar, my dog is super happy to hear it. And they're like, oh, that. But the minute I take them outside, they're upset. Well, why are they happy? Because they get to go with their human, their parent codependency, codependency, codependency. Now you're seeing what it all makes sense. And they go outside, and then all of a sudden, they're like, holy crap. They go into that mode exactly, as always. Day two, day three, day 400, two years later, they're still in that. Then people try to give their dog treats, or they've been told to give their dog treats. When it's dysfunction, it's psychological. Go to the vet. The vet said you have a dog have a behavioral problem. They prescribe psychopharmaceuticals. They prescribe drugs. For the psychological issues to temper it down to put the dog into the fog like giving a dog like someone giving you uh, a drink you walk away from your drink at the bar 
and then you come back and you're like, why am I woozy? Right? So the dog is fighting that. And I talk about in other things of that part of it. Um, but it, overall, it's the stress that goes on and that connection of being able to be with your dog and the family itself to be able to survive and exist and have a happy time outside is paramount to letting your dog know that they're safe, to letting your dog know that they're protected, that they're defended. And I talk about um, uh, Deborah with her dog, Leo, who um, Leo is nine years old and was attacked three times, almost a fourth time, almost, right, for those of you who are following me, but attacked three times over nine years by dogs that were off leash that ran up to them, uh, his, the, her dog, and attacked her dog. So he's always, um, always scared. And one of the things that happened is Leo and dogs like that become betrayed in the fact, in their mind, oh, my gosh, my mom didn't save me. My mom didn't defend me. My mom didn't notice that there was danger there. You see the dogs, you see the wolves, the wild dogs, the wolves and all that stuff, and they're running down in packs. They always have a scout. They always have a dog that's willing to put their own life on the line, a wolf that's willing to put their own life on the line to go ahead to scout things out, to look for prey, to look for safety, predators, etc., To protect the family. And, um, you know, uh, what is it, John Pollock, right, from uh, Adoptals, uh, a few Adoptal groups, he, he runs a few groups, he had said the fact that, you know, our do, you know, alpha pack leader and all that stuff. So I'm just doing a bit of a rehash here. Um, I, he, he talks about the fact that with wolves, and, and we've read this before, wolves, they, they, it's a pack structure, a family structure. They're finally, you know, they've been saying this now for a couple of years on that. It's a family structure, right? Well, dar. But they say there's an alpha male and alpha female that run the pack, the wolf pack. And I'm like, that's mom and dad. That's mom and dad. They've automatically assumed mom and dad. Even the, the wolves that they accept into their pack becomes part of their siblingship. Uh, not siblingship, becomes part of their children, part, part of the family. But the alpha pack is actually mom and dad in a predatorial perspective of course but it's mom and dad they keep the other dogs uh, sorry other wolves in line when we have our dogs more than one right i have five six sometimes seven dogs here they look at me as their parent cross species unbelievable the dog knows that i'm not another dog and they look up to me as in he feeds us he takes care of us, he, he pets them, they don't care about the poo, they don't care about the pee, uh, right, it's just incidental. You go, like I said, that thing about why dogs follow us into the bathroom, right? So they just look up to us, because we're taking care of them. And they're overt codependent. So that's what the dependency that goes on in there. So it's really important that there's not a lot of stress that goes on, that there's that relationship that is there with each other, that we have the emotionality between our dogs, that we see them as living, breathing beings, and that we ourselves follow the same type of emotional context that we have with the people that we love in a relationship that we do with our dog. So that our dog feels everything all the same. And, um, you know, I probably haven't, I didn't mention about that part. Well, I do, yeah, okay. Um, use the language conversationally Dogs understand discordant and disingenuous tone, right? Discordant and or cordant tones, right? So we're just saying, um, just talk normally to your dog as you would talk to each other. They can tell being discordant, right? When there's there's, there's disagreement in the tone, there's a, there's, there's, a, there's no harmony in between the tones. If we're talking to our loved ones, or to just someone on the phone or a friend, we're talking like this. Hey, how's it going? What are you doing? Hey, how 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 things going? How's the dog doing? Hey, you know, how's Joey? How's Andrea? Right, that kind of stuff. Then suddenly, when we start talking to our dog, apparently our dog is like a balloon or a stuffed animal because our tone changes. Hi, how are you? How's it going? Oh, you're such a cute little. Oh, you're such a cute puppy. And I, and. As I've said before, is when we talk to children, two or three year old children, what do they say to us? And when we talk to them like that, don't talk to me like a baby. We want to create 
a cordant behavior on our end, conversationally, not discordant. We want to be able to talk conversationally to our dogs. When we start talking conversationally to our dogs, our dogs understand that there's more of a connection to them, and they go, "Oh, well, why are you talking to me like human, like people? Then your dog picks it up with the relationship between the two of you, and then you're not switching your brain as well from an emotional human sentient being to dog. Emotional sentient being to dog. And people always talk about their dog that are emotionally disenfranchised or frustrated basically with their dog's behavior by saying, that's Mickey uh, balleting with his, his uh, on, the, on the laminate floor here. Um, there, there's that, right? There, there's a change in the tone and the dog, our dogs hear it. That's why I talk about the fact we, meet, we need to maintain eye contact with our dog. It's not confrontational. If you make the adjustment and you just read your dog's eyes, especially a dysfunctional, dangerous, skittish dog, if you read the dog's eyes, you start to see the expression and the way the dog holds their eyes and the way they see and the way they look and et cetera, et cetera. You can see that. And you go, well, you know, it's a dog and I can't see it, blah, blah, blah. Hey, it's the same. I come from the same aspect that everybody else has come from before as well. What started me to see the dogs as living, sentient, intelligent beings that are processing at one tenth of a second, which is three to eight times faster than a human being, is because I realized they have a soul, they have an empathy, they have a heart, they have feelings, they have an existence. They're willing to defend us with their life. That's not a predatorial behavior. Predatorial behavior is me, myself, and I, and then I'll leave the, the carcass for the rest of us, uh, the rest of the family, the pack to eat. The, so the pack mentality, what they call it, I call family, I call it group or family. The family stands and stays together. You see those amazing relationships where the couple are together and they're together for 60 years and they've gone through the most horrible things and maybe one person cheated on another person or another person lost their job or got a drug addiction or something bad has happened. They've lost a child, uh, God forbid that horrible aspect to happen, but they're together. They've gone through thick and thin. They have looked at the simplicity of love and found true love. They're willing to stand up for each other at all times. This is what our dog is willing to do for us, to stand up for us, willingly to give their life to save ours, to defend us right off the bat. And a lot of people who, who know that have had situations where they've been confronted by somebody and their dog is in right away. And you've probably seen those, and I'm just organic here. You've probably seen those dumb videos where people pretend to die or pretend to be attacked and then their dogs just sitting there going like, yeah, whatever. If you watch the behavior of the people, maybe it comes from my acting background or just because I'm just so uh, paying attention to little things and all that. Hi, Sue. Um, is the fact that when you watch those people react, when you watch those people react and pretend to be attacked, Listen to the way that they're reacting. Listen to the way that the person is, that is pretending to attack them. Oh, I like it. Right? They're just, it, it's so fake that I'm watching it on video. I'm like, the guy sounds fake. That's a rotten tomato right there. And then the, uh, the, the victim's like, ah! And then the, they fall fake to the ground and all that. And the dog just sits there going, that's not natural human behavior. But if you were to walk around one day and you accidentally trip and fall and hurt yourself, your dog is right there. The same dog that would be like, oh, in the video, oh, like just standing there watching, the dog is right there. Because there's the, our dogs know when we're being genuine and being fake. And when we're faking our voice, our dog understands it. So when we're not having conversation with them that we have with our humans, our dog goes, yeah, this is this is BS. I don't feel like I'm part of it. And then the dog becomes reactive and reactive and becomes dysfunctional and becomes distrustful of the environment because they don't feel like they belong or they don't feel they're humans or parents can protect them. And they don't even feel that there's a, there's a, a, a cohesiveness. There's no, there's no emotionality. There's no context for them to rely upon. 
But then you see some dogs that become bonded pairs because there's an emotional, if you watch it, there's an emotional context to them. There's an emotional connection. And if one dog, you see the post, they go, well, it's a bonded pair. They can't be separated because then they get depressed. Emotionality, codependence, eh? but it becomes an interdependency. That's what ends up happening. The caution is to forget to treat your dog conversationally, to treat your dog as they're a living being. Every single dog I've talked to, even after they have attempted to, to hurt me bad, I'm still talking to them. Uh, one time, one time Tonka, when I was uh, giving, actually Walter, one time I was feeding, uh, I was doing something around Walter, feeding him or something like that, and then there was another dog, they're right, like I said, they're all resource guarding, just brutal. That's why I talk about the treat thing, and just none of it makes sense. Resource guarding, and I was, I can't remember, I was doing something, I was giving uh, um, some, some treats, right, some, some snacks to them, just because, and I, I can't remember what happened, but something happened, anyhow, so Walter thought one of the other dogs was going to get the, the snack from him, that, so I think it fell to the ground or something, right, you know, you know when that happens, right, and you don't reach down, because then they go after your hand, so uh, I went to separate them or something, and Walter thought I was giving him heck or that I was going to take, it wasn't that why Walter thought I was going to give him heck. Walter just was reacting to the fact that, hey, you know what? Don't take my, my food that fell on the floor because it was right beside him and he was the one that was shock collared to train him not to be resource guarding and then ended up with the next owner or the owner, two owners or whatever it was, attacking a child that walked by his food bowl and that child required plastic surgery. All of these aspects of it. But anyhow, so something happened in that sense of it. And it was my fault because if I was paying attention, it would not have happened. Same thing when you're walking with your dog on the leash and your dog pulls you and you fall to the ground or the leash pulls out of your hand, it's your fault. It's my fault because I'm not paying attention. So I, I can't remember what it was. And I, and I let my guard down, which would have been bad. And he went and attacked me. And he got me, um, what's your name? He went for my left arm. So he, he went after me in the living room and he went after my arm. And I was like, holy, right? And I was like, and I went and I yelled out his name, Walter, right? I didn't scream it. You can tell there's still a lot of it of control. And I backed away from him and I backed about four feet and he just watched me. And like I say, he's a predatorial dog. So he just looks at you and he watches to see what you're going to do because he has the casualness and the leisureness of being the predator. And he just watched me. And so I immediately shifted from, Walter! Hi, silly boy. And then my heart was beating like freaking crazy. I went, hi, silly boy, how are you? Hi, Walter. And he just stared at me. And I went, Walter! And you can see in the cover video as well, when I'm talking to him, when he's around Minky and Sammy, and he's about to attack Minky, because he Minky had attacked him a few times. And I went, I go, Walter, 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 right? You can see, and I'm talking to him in that cover video, same thing that I did to Walter. I went, Walter, and he kind of looked at me and he blinked and there's a certain blink pattern as he's cognitively processing what's going on and self-regulating his emotional context with me. And then he, I saw the shift in him like, uh oh, he thought to himself. And then I went immediately, come here, silly boy. And I was deathly afraid. And he went, uh, and he just kind of went and walked over to me, not knowing whether or not I was going to be mean and beat him like previous owners had, or what. And then he came over to me and said, hi, silly boy, good boy. And I went down with a big smile, and I started to pet him a bit around the head and the body and all that stuff. And then I was like, oh, and I started getting scared. I was like, okay, calm myself down, Walter. And then I let him go. I said, good boy, silly boy. And then I got the snack again that I was going to give him and I gave him the snack. I maintained the same routine. And it's extremely frightening, but I maintained conversation. And a lot of times what people will do when they're in a situation like that, freaked out. And their voice is gonna be like, stop, right? And they're gonna run out of the room and all that stuff. I talked about Nero where, where again, when Nero went to attack me on the couch, I got up and I sat back down and had my left arm in front of my throat in case he, he attacked me there. But I went back in and I just carried one on what I did before. And then and I walked out into the hallway. I was like, holy crap. And I was, uh, I, I, I was 
breathing a bit heavy at the time and they say dogs can sense fear it's not fear they can just see your breathing they can sense your breathing pattern they can smell the 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 the, the way your 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 body is now breathing a little bit more and there's more of concentration of whatever the chemicals coming out of the brain out of the body <laughs> And I just went back and I was like, okay, hi, Walter. Hi, silly boy. I'd make an acknowledgement. He just looked at me like, oh, okay, cool. Like, it wasn't like, oh, okay, cool. But it was just like, oh, well, just normal. Nothing happened. I didn't get in trouble. My human didn't get angry at me. It was just no harm, no foul. Right? And, and of course, my arm hurt for a few days. And, and, but I maintained a, a conversation with him. The skill with Walter or Nero or Tonka and the scale with uh, um, uh, Minky being a skittish meat dog or the people that I worked with today and or yesterday is different. And I've said to them when I'm working with their dogs, how I behave and work with their dogs is much different than I work with the predatorial dogs, the dogs. And I showed the video uh, on the video yesterday, the picture of where Walter uh, Tonka grabbed the shelter work and you saw her arm was ripped open. 42 stitches there, like just skin missing and all that stuff. <laughs> but I still maintain a, a, a homogenous type of conversation with him as I would with Minky, as I would with a regular dog. The conversation always has to be the same. The other thing that has gone, which I'm going to get to the other part here, and that's why I say dogs understand discordant, disingenuous tone, just like us. If we don't think dogs can understand the changes in our voice, then we're really arrogant. We're really an arrogant species if that's what we think. The dog understands that our tone is emotionally uh, related. Maybe the scientists will figure this out in 50 years, 100 years after I'm gone, but this is the digital legacy and all stuff. But our dogs sense it, and they know it. So usually language conversationally, under, dogs understand discord in this ingenuous tone. Um, the other part is standing still with your dog. I talk about leash control, right? Dominant leash control in another uh, episode before that, and actually two episodes. Uh, but one I talk primarily about the psychological, the psychology of having the proper leash and how to control the leash and be a leash ninja and um, showing your dog that they have a certain length always so then they don't have it. Because uh, there's a territorial perimeter, a circumference that happens. Oh, sorry, circumference that happens. There's a territorial circumference that happens with the leash. And the dog doesn't understand that they have a, a set circumference, a six-foot circumference with a standard six-foot leash. And you're always spaghetting it and all that stuff then it causes the dog to feel, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I don't know how far away I can, I can do it. I can run away if there's an issue. And as I said before, I have dogs, again, like for example, Tonka, Walter on a leash, and if, they're if he's behind me, I mean, sorry, if there's a dog that comes up to be reactive and, and for some reason Tonka becomes scared of that dog, which he, not usually, but when he has become scared of a dog, He'll go right behind me to the end of the six-foot lead and just stand there. And he'll stand sideways. You notice that. You'll see that. The dog will stand sideways because they're not going to stand with their back that way to us. They're going to stand sideways. There's a reason why. There's a reason why. It's kind of like the codependency aspect. It's kind of like the jealousy aspect. It's, it's, this, it's the defensive measure, uh, all these other parts of it. But to this point of this conversation here, the dog will stand sideways. And they'll stand behind with enough uh, a perspective point so that they can see the approaching dog. But we want to be, uh, we want to be, I don't know what you're talking about here. Um, so, sorry, I'm just going to scroll down here. I haven't looked at the other stuff. Oh, sorry. Oh, wow. Okay. Hey, Mike. Um, okay, I changed my address. Let's see. Uh, Mike, I won't be able to get to Ghost today just because um, I have to do Sue's thing. And Sue had contacted me sooner. Um, but yeah, so what ends up happening is uh, we want to stand still. Go to the dog park. Go around anywhere where you see somebody with a dog that is somewhat skittish or that the human is somewhat skittish or nervous or scared, right? It's normal because, again, in our heads, 
we're like, we don't know how to control this crazy dog that doesn't look normal like in the Budweiser commercial. Which I have to say, Budweiser, uh, you know, you guys have these cute little dog and horse commercials, but what are you actually doing for animal advocacy, right? There we go, okay? Anyhow, yeah, there's me and my advocacy again. But you see the people with their dogs that are nervous, and they're always like spaghetti up the leash, and they're always moving and moving and moving, and they're always, they stand one place here, and then they start backing up. And they start backing over here and they start backing over here. You try talking to them and they're just like all over the place and they start walking their dog all over the place. And it happens all the time. doesn't matter if it's in group. doesn't matter if it's a private session. It happens all the time. So it doesn't mean that anyone's being singled out. It just happens all the time. I want people to know that because they're like, oh, you're talking about me. No, you're not. talking. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about your dog. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so you want to stand still when you're working the leash because standing still shows confidence, shows security, shows that you're not worrying, that you're not trying to change positions, that you're not getting ready to escape. That you are aware and observant and watching for things to happen. If you start moving around, you start fidgeting, you start even, even if you move, you're standing and you move one foot the other way, and I showed this today in group and yesterday as well. You move one foot, the dog's immediately like, what? Right? They see it. It's how they process things through. Like I say, the field of vision is like a slivers of the frame as well, like an abstract memory, right? But the field of vision is that part with redundancy and rhetoric as well as anticipation or anticipatory behavior that they're expecting, right? It's not habituation, which is so incorrectly described. Like these words that these behaviors say, they're so clinical. There's no context to them, and it disrespects the dog as a living being. It, 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 it devalues the dog as a toy. But it is all about having that connection where we let our dog know that we respect them, that we're protecting them, that we're our dog's parent. So it's like the child. You're standing at a busy intersection about to cross with your child, you're not just going to let your child, you're not going to stand there while your child's fidgeting and nervous about all this, these big, huge semi trucks driving by downtown or what, right? And these big rigs are driving down and these speeding cars are driving down and taxis are driving down and your kid's like nervous and all that. What do you do? You say, stand still, right? Don't, don't be nervous. And what do you do yourself when you're holding on to this child is getting all like, eh. you're standing still. You're not moving your feet at all. Why? Because subconsciously, you're showing your child that you have control. Even the most nervous and dysfunctional woman or man, parent, with the, the, the dysfunctional with their dog, watch them with one of their own children. They just stand there. Suddenly, there's a shift how they're treating their child versus how they're treating their dog. They're standing still with their child before they're crossing the street. They're standing still to prove to their child that they're safe and that mom, dad are paying attention to what's going on. Uh, from Barbara, hi James, I have a male rescue dog from Deborah and Port of Verla I can't pronounce these darn words. Why do you guys why do you why do you guys use L's? Don't use L's. Do you not know uh, I can't pronounce L words? Okay, um, that is supposedly over two years old, but he still pees like a female. Wondering what you think of this. He's a Malinois. You know what it is, and and, and I have I haven't never talked about that part about why some dogs squat. And I have I have over a hundred different topics that I have in this book that I'm never going to write. Uh, I would love to write a book. I mean, anybody could, could read off my my blogs and all stuff. Anybody wants to write a book, let me know. Um, but it's why some of the dogs, right, when they squat, male dogs squat. It, it, it's, it's really basic reason. It's, it's, it's like so dumb why some people are like, you know, they're trying to show dominance by lifting the leg and peeing up really high and all that stuff and blah, 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 blah. All my Danes, Minky, who's a little tiny dog, my Danes who are 34 or 36 inches at the withers, they, they used to sometimes lift up their leg, but now they just squat when they pee. There's a really easy reason why. For the bigger dogs and all that stuff, they lift up their legs, and the smaller dogs, why they lift up their legs? 
more than anything else, okay? So here it is, really simple part, right? Remember I talked about, somebody said, oh, you know, to look at Vermont dog trainer and, you know, oh, you know, the guy's talking about this leash, I mean, about the dog's tail and what it means, and then it's like, the guy's just so dumb. It's like, oh, when the base, you don't look at the base, you look at the base of the tail, you don't look at the top. It's like, what? The dog can control the tail articulate from the tip all the way down to the base so why would you not watch the full articulation and the tail behavior it's an indicative cognitive processing and emotional processing context okay anyways right so um the ping is the same part they lift their leg up so that the p primarily not just for the sniffing aspect of it which is just another aspect of, of uh, self-esteem and, and territory right but they lift up their leg so that the pee doesn't splash and hit the rest of their legs because you see the dogs always cleaning themselves and they don't if they don't have to pee on their leg they're not tracking the pee wherever they walk which then allows their predators to follow them and find where they live so that's why the dog lifts up their leg you see the female dogs and say, oh, some female dogs lift their legs. It's because they've learned by watching other dogs. They go, oh, that must be what I'm supposed to do because I'm part of this family, I'm part of this group. It's something that I see. Oh, that's what I'm supposed to do. They've learned it, right? The mimicking, why dogs follow your finger when you point and all that garbage stuff, the silliness. So they've learned it. They've taught themselves that if they want to be part of it, they're going to do it. So there's the dogs here, if, if, they, if they don't squat, they pee and the pee splashes all over their uh, over their pants. I mean, all over their back legs, and then they have to clean it up. They track that smell everywhere because the pee, the scent, because of the tracking of animals, will pick it up and they get followed home. So they know how not to be trapped. They're not stupid dogs. It's everything they do is defensive. It's not fight or flight as per se. It's defensive measure instinctively that dogs are. All right, so I hope that answers some people's questions about why the dog pees and then female dogs. And if you watch the way a female dog, when she lifts up her leg to go pee, it's not physically the same structure as a male dog does, which means it's a mimic, which means that the female dog is mimicking because they don't understand the, 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 the physics of why they have to lift their leg when they pee. Because the male dog has to lift up their leg so that they can pee so that their penis starts to lift up a bit more as well and then they splash it on the side and any guy that knows if you're drunk and you have to go pee you don't pee on the floor because then it splashes on your leg you pee against the wall so it doesn't splash it's just simple logic that goes on and then the science is like oh maybe this is why this is a, it's a dominant thing and then we follow the alpha thing and we keep going the alpha the dogs that pee up on the side, it's a protection aspect as well. When you see them peeing up against a telephone pole or a thing, whatever, watch them. They're looking on three sides. They're not looking on the side where the telephone pole is. They're watching everywhere else because it's protection from being attacked. That's why I say to people, watch the, your dog's eyes. And they, all of my dogs out here, they face out when they pee now. And then they look back at me or they look sideways and then I make the acknowledgement. I talk about the seniority and peeing and all that stuff in other vlogs. You want that information, you either go back and watch the last 26 hours or you just pay attention to what I'm doing onward. Everyone, you know, and it's nice. I, I, and I love it. People say, well, it's just too much information. Keep it short. But you know what? Like I said, you might as well do this. Something happens, you know, whatever. Uh, Sammy says, I had a big male Roddy that got aggressive with people that were afraid of him. It's not aggression, Sammy. It's not. It's protection. You, if you were able to protect him, if he felt that you were protecting him, he wouldn't, he wouldn't be aggressive as much. And if you told him not to try to protect everyone, he would end up listening to you, right? My guys are the same way. When they first come in, they're reactive, right? They're reactive, consequential. They, they're going to go after other dogs. Neighbor, they see a dog 100, you know, five houses away. They start reacting. Right, they start barking. Okay, then I should not get angry. I don't know what this thing is about Momo, uh, Sue, because I haven't read your post. Uh, okay, you watch, yeah, it'll be tomorrow, Mike. Uh, so makes so much sense, uh, Sue. Okay, Sue, all right. <laughs> so that answers the part about the peeing and the lifting, and I, like I said, I've had a much more in-depth uh, topic about it, or description about this topic, about the peeing and what it happens, and the, and the psycho, uh, only those that were afraid he was fine with other people. Yeah, then it's the, then it's the body language and the gait and the cadence of people and the tone of voice and yada yada, right? Like even um, I say, I, I have said to people, uh, you know, 
uh, I either go in as the good guy or I go in as the bad guy to dogs, so to speak, in the sense of they or either I try to be nice to them, they love me, or I try to be somewhat mean to them, not really mean, but pushing their buttons in that sense so that they're reacting to me so that way I can see their behaviors. And a lot of times people will say, oh, my dog's never done that before. You're, you know, you're the only person. Why, why is he doing this and all that stuff? Well, because I see your dog able to do that. And wouldn't you rather see your dog with the potential to be this kind of aggression than waiting two or three months and your dog then exhibits that aggression because it builds up, it aggregates, not trigger stacking because it aggregates over time in the way your dog is reacting and then suddenly your dog bites somebody and you're like, that's the first time he ever bit him. I've never seen him do this before. I see what your dog has the potential to do. I'm reading that two tenths of a second. Like I said, any dog, I can push their triggers enough to, to not manipulate them, but to see where it creates discomfort for them, where they feel threatened in the sense of, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, this is, this is not something I'm comfortable with. I feel unsafe. And then they, then they consequentially react and like, right? So uh, that's what ends up happening at the end of the day is we, we have to have our conduct around our dogs. We have to be stable when we're standing. We have to give confidence to our dog. We have to talk normally to our dog. Even when we're stressed out, we have to fake it. How many times have you talked to somebody that you're going, you just start dating with her or him, whatever, okay, you're, state, you're dating some, some is it, because apparently my demographics here is like it's primarily women. Um, that are here because women are provide the, the pet care. 72.1% of households, women provide the pet care. So, and I see the demographics because my, my thing shows the demographics afterwards. And it's a certain age group, but it's predominantly women. It's about 25 year span and it's predominantly women. So I'm just going to talk about it uh, as women, right? I mean, women take care of the world, right? If, the, if women ran the world, you wouldn't have... A, a monetary greed as much. You wouldn't have wars. You would have a lot more empathy. Animals would probably already be recognized as functional sentient beings with limited legal rights, all that stuff. Um, yeah, anyways, we're just not respecting the fact. Uh, and it's, it's too bad. It's, just, it's a male dominant society. Like every dog, almost every dog, the abuse comes from a guy. Almost every dog that I've dealt with. There are some mean women, um, but predominantly it's uh, it's guys. And so for me, it's just like, err, right? And, and I'm sure a lot of women out there, you can say, yes, that's true. A lot of douchey men out there, really. Uh, anyways, so um, use regular conversation. Don't fidget on your feet. It's like fidgeting, like I talk about with the leash and the control, like cruise control, like I said to people today in my group. It's the same thing, right, for those of you who, who know me, know my work, and have been following my vlogs. The fidgeting, right? Like, like you see me moving around all the time, and I have to stop myself from fidgeting because I can see it on the – right here on the screen is, is where I'm looking at. So I can see myself fidgeting. I'm like, okay, i got to stop fidgeting. I'm like, okay, put my hand below the camera, but then you can see me moving around fidgeting still. So I'm like, okay, I got to be calm. Imagine watching, this, right? You're like, hey, if I'm doing this 20, you're like, mm, okay, James is, you know, he needs some CBD oil to get rid of those seizures or something. So it's just, it's, we want to be still. It's like just, again, if you have a bad day at work and you want to talk to somebody, you're going to phone up your friend that's going to talk you off the ledge versus the friend that's going to say, yeah, your job sucks and you should quit. You should find another job. And then you go and listen to them and then you're screwed because you're like, actually, the job I had before was pretty good. I had my seniority, my groove and all that stuff here, right? And when you talk to the person that's going to talk you off the ledge, how do they talk to you? You know, it's okay. Don't worry about it. It's just a job. It's okay. You know what? Just, just do your... Don't, don't get involved with the gossip there. and Just do what you do and just stay out of it. And I know, but it's only eight hours a day. Versus the person, you're like, yeah, that, that, that job really sucks and you shouldn't be there because it's horrible and um, they're not treating you well and things are really bad. And then you go like, oh, I'm, you're right. I have been disrespected. It's not a good job. It's horrible. I, I would do better somewhere else. You're right. 
versus the person again you know the job is just don't worry about it it's just chill out it's okay right and I get that too when I have sometimes uh, some of the clients that hire me and some of them you know some guys like I said guys right some of the guys are like they're just they're, they're very Mm, they're very difficult because I'm asking them to have an empathy that sometimes they don't feel is allowable to exhibit overtly codependency, right? They're not allowed to do it because of their own way they grew up. They're stoic, which happens a lot in the Asian community and other uh, older uh, communities. Okay, so I'm going to go down here to Sue's thing. And um, I'm just going to read this stuff off here. For those of you who are following this in my group, uh, reactive dog group you'll see the photos that Sue has put up um, and Sue right so we've kind of gone back and forth before I approved your post because it wasn't structured in a, in a right way uh, and it didn't have any photos it didn't have any clear photos right we had that other kind of uh, meme type photo which is, is not working um, for anybody who wants to post in it you've got to post it in the same template format the same clear concise paragraphical context so that way it makes sense so I can refer back to it for people who are following along most times when I get this from people I just say send me clear photos of your dogs eyes face and body so I can get a sense of them their history and overall issues and I just let them send me whatever it is I, I've had three sentences and I've had paragraphs that are just one single block of paragraph and I'm just like what is this? What are they saying? I gotta, I gotta hold something up against a screen sometimes. Um, so when it comes to the group, Sue, I do it so the other people who are in the group that have similar dogs, like someone else commented on your post, they said their dog Mellow, who looks like a marshmallow, ha ha ha, that's why you called him Mellow, had, that person said, my dog is like that too. So this allows me, when I go through the post, everyone else to understand doesn't matter to me I got I got trolled in my uh, in one of my posts uh, by somebody who came to uh, 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 a group session training through Kugo and uh, with her dog Wilma or her foster whatever it is Wilma and she's a science editor and she thought she was so smart she's young and she's blonde and she's attractive and all stuff and so she thought she was so smart by going after me in a very nice subtle way and i was like you can tell by the first sentence and she said one sentence like oh because i was uh, getting trolled by somebody so she goes and writes down uh that seems to happen to you a lot right getting trolled and i it's just the way the cadence the rhythm and i look at her photo and i can destructure the way she looks and you know, her behavior and all that stuff and I read the facial structure of her body, right, and see how it is, and look, right? And then I was like, yeah, she's trolling. She's pretending to be nice, and she's trolling. And then she started asking these passive-aggressive questions in a certain structure format, and I was like, okay, you want to play games? Do you think I'm stupid? All right. So I just dragged her in, and I dragged her in, and she thought she was getting better, and she's like, why are you being so reticent, and why are you paranoid? I'm like, oh, no, I'm not paranoid, and I just kept using keywords. Sorry, Minky. I kept using keywords deliberately to let her think that she was more intelligent and more uh, um, structured than me. So then I just kind of went on, and then I allowed her to bury herself with the rope that she was hanging herself with, and then I got her, and I got her with exactly 13, 13 uh, points that she did not answer, and I, and I brought it right up to her. And... The interesting thing, before she said that, she was like, you know, why are you not doing this? I just want to donate to, to, the, to, to Gordon the Bulldogs uh, thing. And, you know, and I said, oh, have you shared her po his post? Ignores the answer. Oh, if you want to donate, you can donate to me. I'm a registered nonprofit, and I'll forward it through, send me screenshots, and then I'll publicly announce how much you donated so everyone knows. She ignored it. And then I said, have you shared it? And she ignored that. And I, so basically, I blew her away at 13 points where I said, but one of them was essentially you haven't shared his post. You weren't going to share his post. You used the fact that you want to, do to donate as subterfuge for sharing his post, but you had no intention to do so. And um, uh, actually, I'm, you know, I'm going to read it before I get to you, Sue, because just, it just really irritates me when, 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 because this is the kind of person who does this to other people. And you'll see me where I, I call her out on it. And uh, let me just see. Let me just see here. It just, uh, let me just see here. Okay. I'm just going to pull it up here. 
Um, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so, so you know, right, right off her first post, and this thread is like 20, 29 replies. She says, you seem to have constant drama, right? So I said, you know, it's what happens when I try to teach the simplicity of my work. It makes unstable people feel they own a part of me. The irony being I do all this for the dogs for free. I get trolled in groups all the time when I talk about my work and how it's 100% provable. And then, you know, and then so she goes, I definitely see you get trolled in other groups. So she then tries to like, mm, do it. Like, okay. And then somebody else uh, uh, comes in and I said, I said to the first person, I said, you know, yes. Yeah, so either we let the trolls, bullies and racists win with intimidation or we stand up for what we believe in. So of course, in her mind, she's like, yeah, he's just saying this, right? And I'm like, oh, oh yeah, she, she's taking the bait and she takes the bait and she follows it through. And then one of the, uh, she, she comments on, on a post reply to somebody else. She says, can we see a follow-up video of how this dog is doing? And I said to her, it's actually in his post. So you, sh you should look at it. And her being a science editor, she should know this. And so she doesn't. And then she goes, hi, I looked through your website. I'm like, why are you looking through the website, right? It's in, the, it's in my rescue page, man. And she goes and says, but couldn't find any follow-up. Can you post a link? And I'm like, oh, really? Are you, are you really that, like, are you that arrogant, that conceited that you actually think you're going to trick an old guy? And so I said, are you planning on donating to Gordon's care? Have you shared his post? Two questions. She ignores it. I reply again, basically the same thing. And I say, thank you so much for asking to donate. And she ignores it again. Long story short, so I'm just going to go on this part here where we get down to the end of it. Um, so uh, one of them says, Oh, actually, I want to say one of the things here. Um, she's, one of them, she goes, uh, you know, James Chai, we did trading on May 17th with my dog, Wilma. I adopted through Kugo. You seem almost paranoid. Why? And I reply, I don't remember. You, I don't recall your name. You'd be a client of uh, Kugo's. They have reverted back to using a treat trainer. You can understand my concern for the foolishness of treat training dysfunctional dogs. Because she's, if she was there, she would have seen the work and all that stuff, right? So, and then I said, you use two words with derisive connotation. Nor am I paranoid. It's being guarded. Look at your opening comment, which is, quote, you seem to have constant drama. It doesn't appear genial is what I say. And go on and all that stuff. And I said, you know, you're asking questions on my personal page. Why not on Gordon's post? And then she goes, where's Gordon's post? She already said she knows through the website, looking through all this stuff, but she can't find his post. So I'm like, okay. She goes, I'd love to comment on it. I'd love to find out what he's doing. That's why I'm asking. And then I just quote back to her what she, I asked her to answer, give her the quote back. Then she again goes, I'd love to donate to Gordon's care, but you refuse to share the name of the rescue he's currently with. Why? Then she adds on a few seconds later, a few minutes later, transparency is paramount when it comes to rescue. And then I said, I'm not sure why you're ignoring my questions. And, you know, long story short, and I, and I give her a, a, a long winded response because that makes her think that she's drawing me in emotionally. Right, we do that. You, you you leave an emotional link to something. They think, oh, now he's upset. And then what ends up happening is the arrogance of humanity, especially people who are, are intelligent, go, ooh, I got the guy now. He's on the run. Well, okay, well, you want to play possum, play possum. And then she goes, <laughs> and one of the last quotes, because I bring her in again, and I say, as you leave yourself to being blocked, so-and-so, there's no obfuscation, right? I'm not covering, I'm not hiding, no obfuscation. Uh, and then I say her name again, I, and I say her name again, right? Because then now she feels that she's being talked down to because I'm using her. She thinks I'm being disingenuous to her and, and, and patronizing her. So I say, answer my questions. It's that easy. Being petulant and casting dispersion is your choice. You're being lazy. So if you're an academic and you're a science editor, and you're an editor of science means you must be smart, proficient, and looked up upon to be able to have a job academically sound. So I said, you're being lazy. So of course, that's going to get her upset. So she replies back an hour later, I assume you don't know where Gordon is, and that is why you're avoiding answering the question, why would I donate money to your rescue instead of directly to the rescue who has Gordon now? I didn't know you ran a rescue. I'm so confused by your hostility and ultimatums. It seems like you're looking for a reason to block me. For what reason? I have no idea. Why so defensive and paranoid? Can't a gal be curious? One paragraph. She lost control of herself now because she thought she has me on the ring. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is just so freaking easy. Give them a couple of days. People like this do this all the time. So I reply back to her, so-and-so, and I give her 13 points. The, number one, the answer to your questions are in Gordon's post on my rescue page. You're too lazy to look. 
Number two, you have no genuine intent to donate as you use your declaration as subterfuge and or manipulation. Number three, if you attended the Kugo group session with Wilma, you would have heard that I run a registered nonprofit rescue. Number four, if you had seen that I get trolled a lot in other groups, you would have read and seen my mentions of me running a rescue org. Number five, if you had checked out my profile, it's clearly stated in the about me section that I run a rescue. And then I say six, so then I get to her on that part of the academic. If you can't do elementary research, a couple of clicks and you'd have your answer, how observant are you? Which then reinforces the fact that she's lazy. Number seven, regarding your confusion by my hostility and ultimatums, use your science editing skills and reread from the beginning of your comment. If you can't see what you've done, perhaps you're tone deaf, which then answers the fact that people who are science oriented, academically oriented, have a certain lower envelope of emotional context, uh, context, uh, contextuality. So you just get, get these people what they know they don't have, and you just blow them away this way. So, and I'm not trying to lure, I've done it to lots of other people in the sense who start trolling me because I just, you know what, go ahead and keep feeding me and thinking you're doing it and eventually I'll just make you. So anyways, so I said to her number eight, uh, reread your comment thread. I asked you to answer questions you deliberately refused, which I brought up uh, three times before that. Number nine, the truth, your game is tiring. Read the grammatical structure, syntax, etc. of your writing. It's disingenuous. You may do well with your peers and friends in discussions, feeling enthralled with your debate skill set. Unfortunately, not here. Number 10, you know if you were actually going to donate, you would have from your initial comments, right? Her first comments, she would have. She never did. And I said, you did not. 11, you know you haven't shared Gordon's post, which is why you repeatedly refuse to answer such a simple question. Number 12, you know if you intended to donate to Gordon, you would have also shared his post. This is what I call relational compassion, right? If you want to donate to someone's plight, a dog or a human, you're gonna share their post. It's natural human nature, which means this is what, and I went on, and as you are going to be blocked shortly, so-and-so, here's proof you're deficient in research and apathetic in effort. Number 13, you would have read in Gordon's post, not just the answers you repeatedly asked, but that Kugo was also involved, which means she didn't pay any attention and she was lazy and so forth like that. I use the number 13 for the 13 points because 13 for an academic is not supposed to mean anything because it's 13. It's not an unlucky number. It's just a regular number to an academic. But for a person who thinks that they have something over other people because they have the intelligence and somewhat the emotional context, 13 throws them off. Then I write down after I said, uh, but that, you know, Kuga was involved. I went, funny, huh? Ironic, eh? So then using language that is the vernacular, which is a bit indigenous to this country. Read your grammatical structure, your flow and rhythm of your words. These are relational to your cognitive process. From that, it's simple to construct your character and intent and debate process. So basically what I said to her is, I had you from the first comment that you had. Anybody who's been trolled, you know, you already know, it doesn't make me a special person, but you already know you're getting trolled. It doesn't matter, you can tell, because we, those of us who don't, like I think uh, what um, Christina has said the other day, but you know, criticism, you can either hide and stick your head down on the ground and do nothing, or stand up and fight for it and stand up with the criticism as well. So anyone who's been trolled, you all know, you can sense it by the way people write, yeah, this person is trying to troll me. So we just, we feed them in, feed them in, drag them in, and so I, I said, uh, yeah, so, um, you know, it's simple to construct your character and intent and debate process. So essentially exposing her, uh, her immaturity. You demonstrate academic deficiency. You may wish to stop skimming your scientific articles. You're missing the trees for the forest. So it's a bit of a turn on that maxim. You have an amazing day. I'm off to my group sessions. I'm sorry we have defects of our friendship. And again, that creates loss in her. It creates that futility in her of saying, oh, you've challenged me now. Academically, you're trying to prove to me that something has happened and you've brought the, all the points that I keep avoiding. I'm not acknowledged anymore. So I devalued her behavior. The same thing I do with dogs in the sense, but it's different because the dogs are not premeditated. They're consequential, whereas human beings are premeditated. So we got to reverse destructure the engineering aspects of the way a human being thinks and processes. So then, 
she replies back, uh, so then I reply back, and this one, because I, I didn't put it in the same paragraph, uh, the same long thing, because if I put it in the same long thing, she would have lost context of everything, because then it would have just blended all in. And so there I go, uh, so-and-so, I do want to add your comment, can't a gal be curious? Indicates you've used your aesthetics to convince others of your acumen. It's looks, it's, char it's charisma, Neither, neither of those convey intelligence. Have some self-respect and stop using one's appearance to succeed. So in other words, stop pretending you're so pretty to get your way because the only reason you're winning the argument is because you're pretty. Most guys are not going to argue with a pretty woman because they want to get laid or at least be friends with you. Duh. But she has used it to a point where she thought, mm, I'll throw in the gender card, right? So, and then I say, at the level of people I work with, looks get a person nowhere, which is true. It's intelligence and cognitive structuring. So I recall back to her behavior beforehand saying that I, you're just, you're, you're the kid on the tricycle with two wheels as well. I suggest you focus on your intelligence more so going forward. And then using the gender card, it's like listening to an intelligent person losing an argument, start using profanity. Then I showed how crass and how immature her behavior her was and her only response back five hours later. Five hours later, James Chai, I finally found Gordon. I was surprised to learn he may not be paralyzed. Are you familiar with the Dunning-Kruger effect? Now she's trying to be helpful because she's trying to ingratiate herself out of the desperation to prove that she has an equal balance of footing with me. Any one of you guys can do this. Any one of you guys can do this. Just drives me nuts when I get trolled by people and if you're just going to be a jerk, be a jerk about it. But don't try to pretend that you're a pretty person, that you're going to get away with it. It's disgusting. And it's like devaluing yourself. Anyhow, so there's my, 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 my Sunday night rant. I just had to do that. Okay, all right. So now so I'm going to go on your thing. I, guess I knew if I didn't do a rant today <laughs> that you guys would be disappointed. And people were like, where's my popcorn? I got the popcorn right here. James didn't go on a rant today. So I just thought, well, I'll just mention it, you know. <laughs> Boom. All right. Okay. So Sue says, <laughs> Sue says, thank you. Whoever's laughing, thank you. Um, but yeah, you can see it on the thing, right? And it just, <laughs> ah, anyways. Okay. So Sue says, uh, thank you so much for all that you do with dogs, James. Oh, and thank you, Sue, as well, for uh, subscribing to my YouTube channel following me on my Facebook and all, which you already have anyways for a while now. I remember you, I see your name uh, often. Okay. Momo is a rescue from California. Oh shoot. You know what I'm going to have to do? I'm going to have to open up another window so I can see what Momo looks like. Cause I have no idea what, uh, um, yeah, you know, I was bullied a lot, Sammy bullied a lot. Um, but you know, immigrant child my my sisters didn't get bullied as much as the boys did in our in our thing right because it's just it's just the way it is um i grew up in victoria i was born there so victoria is, uh, was a small town at the time you know like i think it was less than two hundred thousand people and uh you know anyways so let me just pull this part up here for sam uh, for sue's um post okay so i'm gonna just read off of sue's post instead Thank you so much for all you do, James. Momo is a rescue dog from California. He was in a high kill shelter and terrified. They found her in a field. She was not fixed. The first picture is of her when they brought her to the kill shelter. So let's just see what she looks like. Okay, so brought her, So that's the one in the car. This is Anthony. Anthony is 19 months of age. See how big his head is? See how big his head is? He eats, almost, he eats over three pounds of raw a day. And Anthony is up for adoption. Anthony is up for adoption. So uh, he's extremely affectionate. And anybody who wants a Velcro Dane that's 160 pounds, Anthony is your life-size teddy bear dog. He he's just he would lay on you for if you could carry him in a backpack, he'd be like, "This is perfect. I'm home. <laughs> this is my human." Um, okay. So uh, the first picture is of, uh, of Momo uh, on the way there when he was taken out there. So you can just see right off the structure there that he lived outside a bit as well, in and out, Sue. Okay. 
Oh, you saw, what did you see? Oh. Oh, what's that? Uh, I do, one moment, that's it. Yeah, that's it. A million rant, yeah. I'm not that Alex Jones kind of crazy uh, part of it because, you know, I'm not trying to do it for show. I'm, I'm just like, choke. So, okay. Um, yeah, Anthony's very cute. Okay, so the first photo of Sue is, is it looks to the fact that he has lived outside and he's a bit neglected and all that stuff, okay? So, so we do that part. And then the second one, uh, uh, hey, Debbie. Uh, okay. Uh, they found her in a field. She was not fixed. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. All right. So, like I said, she was lived outside. So, she was in a field. So, then they they, they abandoned her. And But you can tell because of her fur was short and so forth like that, relatively speaking, which meant that she was just literally abandoned on purpose. The first picture is over when I brought her to kill shelter. Okay, Sue, yes. Okay, Sue says yes. When I first got her, she escaped from our house and ran, and I ran after her. When I caught her, Oh, so when you first got her, okay. Uh, I swooped her up and she bit me badly on my hand. She has also bitten my adult son badly about six months ago. Okay, so we're talking five years ago, right? Because I've had her for about five years now. So uh, five years ago to now at this point in time is a bit of a, of a stretch of time, okay? Um, so then she picked up. So the thing is that she's not, she's not familiar with being touched by human beings, especially in an animated state, which means that she has done that. Probably the reason why she was abandoned because... Right, because she's a small dog. It's a type of dog that you could easily just say, hey, uh, do you want my dog to your neighbor? Right? She's that kind of small, kind of cute, kind of looking dog. So that means that she has behavioral issues, which means that if she bit you, means that she's not a, uh, used to being picked up and touched by people. And if she was picked up and touched, she was probably thrown down when she was reactive. And I mean thrown down, like thrown to the floor, like thrown away, like get away from me kind of thing. So there's that. When I take her for a walk, she barks at everyone. When they approach her, she wags her uh, nub of a tail and wants to make friends. Okay, so is she barking at happy bark? Is she, re uh, is she barking upset at other dogs? What is she doing when she barks Sue? There's a 45 second delay from me asking to it showing up till you responding, if you were to respond right away. All right, so you sigh okay, which meant that you're responding back to her abuse, uh, likelihood of abuse because of that behavior when you went to pick her up in a heightened state, okay? So there's that, yeah, super, yeah, you see, you got it, okay. Um, okay, I'm just waiting for Sue. Well, I'll just keep going then. When I took her to the dog park, she barked at people and would instigate a fight with other dogs, large or small, it was scary. Although I kept going and she calmed down, she loved going to the dog park after a while, I moved, and she doesn't go anymore. Upset curiosity. Okay, upset curiosity, so in the fact that she's just kind of like, rah, 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 rah. that kind of bark, right? That rah, 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 kind of bark. So that's one I'm kind of gathering from what you're saying is how she's barking. Um, okay, so if she was barking at everyone, is she barking at other dogs too? Aside from the fact that she fights with other dogs in the dog park, what is the answer to that? So we'll go on to the next one to uh, just keep watching here. Um, when, if, uh, when, if, when, if, okay, when I have her, well, okay, when, if I, okay, when if I have to give her a bath, we have to sneak around her back to pick her up. She tries to bite us. She can give really nasty bites. Yes, but faster bark. Okay, yeah, all right, cool. Um, I don't really bark like a little dog. I bark like a big dog, all right? Just for any of y'all uh, uh, want to know about that, I bark like a big dog. Okay. Um, uh, if I have to give her a bath, I have to sneak around. Okay, she barks at all dogs. And she barks at people then, too, is what you're saying. So she barks at people and at dogs. Okay. All right, so I already know what her issue is and how to address it there, okay? Even before I got to the third paragraph. Sight unseen, I've only seen pictures of your dog. Apparently, I'm not allowed to do that, apparently, in dog aggressive groups. Um, okay, um, if I give her a bath, I'll stick around, pick her up. She tries to bite us. She can give really nasty bites. So right off the bat, you're already petting her wrong. Yeah, you're petting her wrong. She's not used to the human touch in the sense of uh, feeling comfort, and she's not used to the fact that. Um, so that means that when you're picking her up, you you start talking to her right away, uh, and you're like, uh, Momo, Momo, uh, Momo, you're hey, Momo, hi, Momo, you're okay, Momo. Ah, my, my, I'm picking up Momo. You right? You're talking to her like that, I bet. And that indicates the fact that you're nervous and worried, of course, but that you haven't created an actual emotional uh, franchisement. You haven't created an emotional connection with her. That's a trust part because, of course, she bit you, and you've been worried ever since at that point because she's shown that behavior afterwards. Uh, grooming is also a nightmare. She is so uncooperative. 
if I persist, the result is her fur is a wee bit lopsided. Okay, I persist, the result is her fur is a, light, a bit lopsided. Okay, so she doesn't want to be cut. You know, and, and again, um, just her not being familiar with people. Okay, about petting wrong. No, I just pick her up. No talking. Oh, okay. No, no, but I mean in general when you pick her up. Not like when you go to pick up to scoop her up because if you start talking to her, she's going to know. But I'm talking about like when you just in general, like picking her up, like, ah, oh, you start to, ah, oh, you're letting her know you're picking her up. You're making somewhat of a, of a show, not a show, but you're just announcing the fact to, to Momo that you're going to pick her up. Like you're basically telling her, don't bite me. When I go to bed, she licks the back of my ears and then goes to sleep. It doesn't bother me, although I find it weird. I think... I think she thinks I am her puppy. I don't know if she ever had puppies though. What does this mean? It's a codependent, it's an insecurity, it's a low self-esteem issue. When I get when I go to bed and my husband is already in bed, she will growl protecting him. She will do the same if I'm in bed and he comes to bed. It's almost as if she doesn't recognize us until we're close and stops. It's her, her low self-esteem and her insecurity, right? Un, not in, but insecurity. Her not feeling safe and then she finding herself in the only safe place where she gets to relax. She never lets you pick her up. What about when sitting beside you being petted? Does she let you pet her when she's sitting beside you? This is why, like, a little bit more detail, right? Because we went back and forth like six times, seven times. And I said the, the post has to be more detailed, right? So I have to have a, a, a of a Anthony. He, he's right here. That's him chewing on a bone. Anthony, Anthony, come. Right. Hi, Anthony. Okay. Um, oh, yuck. Okay. So, um, yeah, she lets me pet her. Okay. So, uh, how does she let you pet her? Like, you're sitting on the couch. Does she let you, uh, does she come on top of you and lay on your body? Uh, no, it's not. Sorry. It's just like I said, it's going to, right? That's why I always ask for a lot of information, description, like uh, Sarah DeCruz and her dog uh, Prince, right? She wrote like 12 nice paragraphs full detail full flesh and then it allows me to have the photo the picture the mind the, the the quantum image the impression of her intuitively and then i'm able to put the pieces together without having to ask sarah all these questions and start going well is this the case and then going back and forth right yeah anthony's like that um if another person comes in right so when you're on the bed uh, my son says it's an alpha issue although i don't know what the what to do otherwise she's a sweet loving pup thank you for your help uh okay well i haven't helped you yet but the biggest part here is that the insecurity that happens, low self-esteem, insecurity. She's not feeling safe anywhere in the house whatsoever. She's not feeling that you're going to protect her. She doesn't feel that she is a bond from you. She only sees you as an incidental. She doesn't see you as a mothering figure, which is kind of interesting because I talked about that earlier at the start of this post before my rant. But it's the fact that she doesn't feel like she belongs. She doesn't feel like she belongs with your whole family. I don't know if you have you have a son only. Yes, she will come and lie on me and let me pet her in bed. She cuddles between my husband and I. Okay, so if you're already there, and then your husband comes in, like you wrote there, she won't let him in. And then if he's there and you come in with her, I mean, she's he's there with her, and then you come and she won't let you in. So then how is it then, are you saying that you both have to get in bed first before you let her into the bed? And what happened, What happens if she's already in the bed and then you get into the bed as well? Or you both get into the bed at the same time. Well, she let you, like, for, for, for example, she, she let you in first, and you get in the bed, and then she's to your husband, no. Or you know, he goes in first, and then she's to you, no. Like that, does that happen? Or does it be, uh, is it the case where you both have to get in the bed at the same time while she's in there? So she's kind of distracted and doesn't know who to be unhappy with? Or does it have to be where you're in the bed, and then you let her onto the bed afterwards? Because now you're like, okay, now we're safe. Okay, yeah, so no, I, I, yeah, so I don't know which one it is, Sue, sorry. Um, hi, Anthony. So, okay, no problems, but she will bark first. Okay, no problems, she will bark first in the sense that you mean that you can both get into the bed? So then, okay, so if you're already in the bed, then she gets on, and then your husband shows up five minutes later, then she growls? Or is she already on the bed? Then you get in the bed. Five minutes later, your husband shows up and she growls. Like, 
just a little bit more uh, just a little bit more of a definitive understanding you know like context is, is where it happens and the, and the part of like if you're sitting on the couch will she jump up on the couch and sit with you will she be will she let you pet her after she jumps on the couch do you have to call her up can you pick her up off the ground can you pick her, sorry can you pick her up and then put her onto the couch or onto you she's in bed with my husband then if i come in she will break me right yeah you said that already but the question is uh, as we kind of moving back and forth here with a 45 second delay which is crazy because i could just swear if i did swear normally uh, i would just swear and be like, hey, couldn't bleep it out but so if she's on in the if you got if she's in the if she's in the uh okay we'll, we'll do the bed thing first i mean i really want to know how it is in the in the living room because that's the living room, the general area of where your conduct is most of the day of natural behavior is going to be in the living room, right? Where you just normal. Okay, oh, stop it. Um, so, right, because I want to know what she's normally like in the living room. Because her being in your bedroom, it's the end of the night. Those aspects, like somebody, uh, I think, uh, who was it that messaged me earlier today and said, how do you get my two dogs out of the bed? Because they're sleeping in the bed with her and her husband, right? How do I get them out? How do we get them out of the bed? All right, so this is this is a different thing. Yeah, she's very loving on the couch. So then, okay. So then, the question is then, when does she start to nip at you? When does she start to bite at you? Is it only when you go to pick her up? Does she get onto the couch on her own? Do you pick her up to put her into the couch with you, onto the couch with you? So if you go to pick her up off the couch and put her onto the bed, will she nip you? Does she just jump up on the couch and just cuddle with you, right? And so, um, when I pick her up, so she only bites you when you pick her up. So then that means that if you're sitting on the couch, then she'll just jump on the couch and then she's like, aha, and then she gets on, on top of you then. Is that right? Is that what you mean? Okay. Um, so that's the questions that I have here is when is the context of her biting you? Only when you pick her up is what is I'm getting. Okay, so I'm just gonna assume, I'm just gonna assume that she only bites you when someone tries to pick her up. What about when your husband tries to pick her up? What about when your son tries to pick her up? And how old is your son? Does he live at home? Yes, I don't know what yes is referring to, unfortunately, because like I said, we have a 45 second delay. So by the time you've responded, I'm 45 seconds into the future. Um, so then it's, it's hard to sync up on this part of it. So I'm a, uh, so if she's biting you only when she gets picked up, she's biting your husband when he picks her up. Um, is, is, is right. Who, when does she bite? Like, who does she bite? And you're taking her to the dog park. So we're, you know, we're just gonna go to the dog park one. Let, let's just deal with this dog park one, uh, one instead then. Okay. Her, 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 her nip, her barking and all that stuff when she's walking around and all of that. Yes. She won't try and bite my husband when he tries to pick her up. Okay, so she only bites you then. All right, so that means your husband has a, has a uh, somewhat of a lower tone of voice, a, a bit of a, 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 a baritone, and he's gonna be kind of like Jamie's husband in the way he's got a bit of a measured behavior your husband does. Right, he's not, right, he, he's just measured behavior. So when you're outside with Momo, and her reactions where she's barking at everybody, the dogs, the other people and all that stuff. Is she like that with your husband? Is she like that with your son? Is it just you or is it all three of you when you're walking with her? Is she pulling on the leash? She tries to bite me only. So she only tries to bite you only. Okay. So it's only you that's the problem, right? Let's face it. So uh, he's very soft. Okay. So, so, okay. Thank goodness. Then at least I'm right about that, that your husband's measured kind of lower tone, lower kind of guy okay so then the, the 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 primary issue is you right and i don't know how your son is with her and how old your son is and what he's like with her does he bite your son okay so you can answer that later on so when you're out walking there's the part that i have the thing about the psychology of buying the proper leash minky anthony stop right so the the, the question is what is right is what you're doing when you're walking with her and if she's barking all over the place, you gotta stop trying to negotiate with her. You gotta stop, don't negotiate with your dog. 
right? Watch that video about the psychology of the proper leash. Same thing with uh, dogs barking out the window. Um, and the question is too, when you come home and when your husband comes home and when your son comes home, does she jump up on you guys? What is she, her behavior when she's approaching you, all three of you, right? Differently, separately, together, whatever. Does she go to you first? Does she go to your husband first? Or else if they came home, come home separately at different times, what is she like with your husband? What is she like with you? What is she like with your son, right? This is the thing, right? That's why I say when I see these posts and these aggressive dog and these trainers are posting all this stuff or the owners are posting, asking for help, it's like one paragraph. I'm like, you can't learn anything about the dog at all if, you're, if you've got one paragraph of an answer. Like the stuff we're talking about, right? That's why I've said I can't do the writing out vlog anymore because it's just, I, there's just not enough information to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And I can just give people a crutch, but I'm not able to address things. Um, so, so that's why I ask so much information because when you put the, you put the pieces together, right? Same thing like, again, like a, like a human being. You see a person has a certain type of behavior and you're like, well, what's his background? What did he have, you know, did he have parents that loved him or not, right? That kind of stuff. What kind of school did he go to? Son really, her, my son is really with her. We had to go out and my son let her out, but she would not come in, right? Because she's afraid of him. Okay, so she hid from my son. He tried to bring her in and she bit him. So she's got low self-esteem, like I said, unsecurity. She has a high interdependency with you. So her interdependency with you is not a codependency. It's not a healthy aspect. She has a stronger codependency with your husband in the sense that she trusts him and her, she's calm when my husband and I come home. Okay, so she has a, she has a, 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 a interdependency with you that's not based on a relationship, but it's based on her unsec uh, unsecurity. It's based on her low self-esteem. You're enabling her behavior. Okay. You're enabling her behavior. And your son has pretty well went, I'm just not dealing with this at all. I don't want to deal with her. I don't want to deal with Momo. So then there's another disenfranchisement from Momo. So then Momo goes, okay, now the family's, oh, it's interesting. We were talking about this earlier today. So the family is now broken apart. We're, in, we're, we're fractured. The family's all fractured. That's uh, Mickey getting a bone while Anthony's standing beside him. Anthony, Anthony. Okay, so so that's that's what's happened, right? Your son basically just said, "I'm done. I'm not going to deal with her whatsoever. And if I deal with her, I'm going to get pissed off anyway. So I'm not going to do anything." So now for Momo, there's no connection anymore, right? Momo sees your son as like whatever. He's here. Look how fidgety I am. Uh, uh, Momo sees <laughs> Momo, Momo, Momo just sees your son is just like yeah he's just he's he's just lives here with us right so she has no affinity for him she has no connection she, she has no desire from him she has there's nothing that's going on with him and her right um, when it comes to your husband she sees him as like yeah this is pretty cool he gives me the comfort and the stability he's the one that's gonna protect all of us Miki, um, like I say, when you're talking to your dog, when I'm talking to Miki, I'm 100% on them. And even when I'm talking, I'm still aware of everything, right? That's what we do. Oh, stop it. That's what we all have to do when we're out there walking with our dogs. Like you, Sue, when you're out walking with your dog, you have to pay 100% attention to Momo. You have to correct her at all times when she starts barking us up. And you don't have to be violent with it. Don't pull her off her feet, right? Because she's what she's probably like. Well, I don't. I can't tell how, how heavy she is. Probably she's like less than twenty pounds. So you're not yanking her off her feet. You don't have to tug her all over the place, right? Watch the video about the psychology of buying the proper leash. I'll put the links in when I go over this uh, in the in the wee hours. Um. Yeah, last night I fell asleep here on the on the table again. Um in the middle of the thing and I woke up like, why am I talking to myself? Oh, wait a minute. It's the, the computer. Um, okay. So the, the biggest part is the conversation that you're having with her. 21 pounds. Okay. Um, right. So I was, I was, um, uh, okay. So with your husband, he can pick her up, he can pet her and she can cuddle with him and all that stuff. Right. So what you want to do then is, um, 
Sorry, I'm just looking at these happy faces and laughing faces that come up and angry faces. I'm like, and I catch, why are you angry? Wait a minute. It's, I'm talking about something, that's why. Okay. So what, I, what I'm going to say is just pattern yourself after your husband at this frame of time. When you go out for a walk with her, pattern yourself after how your husband does. So it's not that thing I'm like, okay, just do what your husband's doing and that's great. What I'm showing you to do in this novel approach of it with all the information and the disinformation and it's all, uh, I think the word is discombobulated. I, I'm probably murdering that word. It's all over the, it's all like, you know, it's like the, the skeleton's broken apart and we're now trying to put it together with our eyes closed here. So it's kind of hard to follow this, right? Don't worry about it. Uh, that's, that's me, no anger. Okay, okay. Um, so I'm not critical, but I, it doesn't really matter to me, right? Because all it does to me is like, now you go back and you're like, oh shoot, I have to put a better structure in it and then we'll have a better structure next time. And then you'll understand where and what I'm going at. So what I'm saying is pattern yourself after your husband in the way he behaves with her the way he talks with her, because he's, like I say, he's got a, that lower, to, uh, kind of a bassier tone thing, a little bit like, or whatever, right? So do that. And the reason what I'm saying is, because Momo has no identification in your home whatsoever, because of the low self-esteem, the high interdependency that she has with you only, she has nothing with your son. So she has no, so she sees him as a part of an interdependent aspect, because there's no relational uh, connection with, uh, with him. Uh, with your husband, she feels a codependency, where that codependency with your husband is I'm safe. The quote unquote, the hand that bites you, right? She's not biting the hand that feeds her as per se, which is your husband giving her love and safety. He's treating her more like a dog in the sense of too much. So on your end, get you to tone down what you're doing to pattern after him. So when you pattern yourself after your husband, Momo will pick up that your family is a unit. And then it will draw her in to you because you yourself are not mimicking your husband, but you're patterning yourself to what the family cohesive should be. Does that make sense? I'll wait 45 seconds. Um, so it's a novel approach in a sense of because of the, the dynamic that you're describing. Okay, so that's to deal with home. Um, her, her aspect when it comes to the couch, uh, to the bed, and I, I have a thing that I have in one thing uh, in regards to a do you know, dog on the bed. Are they reactive or are they aggressive, right? Okay, I understand. Okay, good. Um, oh, okay, I understand what you're saying. Okay, so... The stuff in the bedroom, that's a different issue regards to is she being, will she attack you or not? Will she bite the other person trying to get into the bed, et cetera, et cetera, right? So like, like the dysfunction that she has, she has one primary dysfunction, but it's a freaking iceberg, right? There's just that one little key part of it. And because, like I say, most likely that she was abused and then abandoned because when she was disciplined by whoever had her beforehand, that was it. They were out. You're out of the house. Because like I said, again, if she wasn't like that, she would have been with another family already or been to the shelter and adopted through that system. In other words, the family was just basically like, we're done. Goodbye. So whoever would have abandoned her, uh, you know, we can guess all we want. I would say, you know, if it was a couple, that it would have been the guy that would have done it because the guy would have been whatever. So in that sort of psychological sense, and I, I, I hate to bring up the, the, the daddy issue kind of thing, right? Because you're, don't worry, Momo is not going to be a stripper dog. But it's kind of like that part of, okay, I see this stability with the man because he's the one that controlled and changed my environment, et cetera, et cetera. The human, the dad. With you, it's uh, something on your end is you've got to pattern yourself after him. Like it sounds so convoluted what I'm talking about when you're like, oh, that's convoluted. But you put the pieces together and you'll see it. So then you pattern yourself after the man, after your husband, not, not a sub subjugated position, not a submissive subjugated position, right? You're not, you're not uh, prostrating yourself to She brought that Don and I, uh, I think, I don't know who Don is. 
I don't know who your son is. I don't know how I asked you how old your son is. I asked if he lives in your home. You haven't answered it, right? She just brought you Don and I. I was I, I was thinking the same thing. She was abused by someone with with the bed is uh, more than likely she was kennelled, right? And and she lived on her own for for you know probably upwards of a week before she was found because you see how when you said that photo of her when she was picked up um, in the back seat there, she's not that badly matted. Right, so with the long fur that she has, she would be badly matted. Like if she lived outside, you know, uh, right? So, so I'm just looking at the second picture where she's sitting down, and she's got one leg out, well, one paw in front of the other one, that she's looking up into the, to the camera. Don's husband's son is 40. Uh, son lives at home, what's his name? Oh, not, oh, not his name, sorry. I mean, just so I know, I, I can't tell who's, well, we'll just say it's your son then, okay. Um, He's 40, he's living at home. Can I come? Can I move in with you guys too? I'm getting tired of paying this rent thing. I don't wanna, I don't wanna, I wanna, I wanna go back home. Okay, so you have a cat as well. Uh, hey, you know what, Sue, I have cat food. If you need a bag of cat food, I have uh, a couple bags of donated cat food left. It's, the brand is My Healthy Pet. It was donated by Falcon Essentials, which is, uh, I put a link in a different one as well. Uh, it's My Healthy Pet, it's a, it's a, really high it's like 10 pound bag is 35 dollars oh he doesn't live at home at 40 okay too bad um but it's if you want you can have a bag of the cat food like say it was donated to me it's free i'm not asking for any donations or anything and i know that you you know you you're it's what you said in your message right so you can have it free there's not you know just let me know i'm near Tinehead park so you can have that um for your cat and it's really good cat food i might actually have a bag of dog food if you're looking for it as well okay let me just see if I can uh, find you a bag or something. And you don't have to buy dog food and cat food for at least two months. Well, with, with Momo, probably not for three months with this bag. Um, okay, so he's sitting there on the couch with the, with the, uh, the, the uh, sorry, the, the footstool with, uh, with your cat. What's your cat's name? And obviously they get along because they're sitting beside each other. Then he's sitting on the couch, the next photo, and he's laying down there. You can see the position that he's laying, right, as he's lifted up his head. Uh, I could live downstairs and pay his rent. Cool. Um, you can see the way he, right? So she is, is laying there in the corner and how she's kind of somewhat spread out and all that stuff. Uh, okay, and then we're back to the photo of her in the car and everything like that. Okay. Um, and, and Joanne, if you're watching or you are watching eventually, right? Joanne says, similar issues, not exact, but similar with our Mello. Uh, Millie is my cat's name. Cute. Millie's a cute name um, for a cat. For a dog, not really. Sorry, I'm just kidding. Um, okay, uh, so so that's why you see when I said in my uh, my private message to you, a uh, response back to you, I said just if you structure and you put a detail and you, you put it all out, then other people will be able to say, hey, you know what, my dog is kind of like this or that and so forth, and they can identify it, and it allows everybody to learn off of your 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 dog's issues, right? So we want to kind of make that things a bit uh, a bit easier. Um, so uh, at this point in time, and we can revisit any time, right? You just post a comment back through it again, um, is pattern yourself after your husband in the sense of it. Don't worry about your son trying to be integrated in with Momo. It's not going to happen because your son's not going to want to because he got bit already, right? And let's face it, when you get bit by a dog, it doesn't matter what size, it freaking hurts. And then you're going to be afraid you'll get bit again and again and again, right? And I have, you know, bites all over my hands and stuff like that, see? So it, it just happens, right? Um, pattern yourself like that. We, Anthony, thank you. Um, when you're out for the walks, stop letting her pull you all over the sidewalk. Stop stopping every time, okay? So there's two things I'm suspecting is happening. She's pulling you everywhere. That she wants to go over here, she wants to go over here, she wants to go over here. You guys are going and you're stopping and you're having like this great conversation with, with each other. Just keep going, but walk slower. And I tell everybody, just walk slower. If you watch your dogs, oh shoot, my battery's down 15%. If, if you watch your dog, Millie, uh, Momo, sorry, Millie. If you watch your dog, Momo, in your house, how fast is she walking from the kitchen to the living room? She's not walking that fast, right? She's just walking. Walk that same speed outside with her. So then it's gonna teach her the casualness that she has inside is the casualness she'll have outside when you're walking, you're not in a rush, but you don't stop. Just keep walking. 
she posed my husband, not me. Okay, I probably made this more confusing. Oh boy, yeah, you did. But here's the thing, and I say this to everyone, leash control, all that stuff, dominant leash aspects of it. She's 21 pounds, right? She's 21 pounds. It's physically impossible for a 21 pound dog to pull a hundred pound weight that's stuck to the ground, right? Put a hundred pound cement block on the ground. There's no way Momo is going to pull that hundred pound block, even if she could pull it even in two inches from its side. So your husband, it's impossible for her to pull you. I pull him. It's impossible for him to be pulled by Momo. It's impossible for her to pull you as well. This guy here, Anthony, come up. Oh, Anthony, come. Make yourself. This is Anthony. Okay. You see his head? It's almost three times the size of mine. It's 160 plus pounds. Okay, Anthony. Minky, Minky, you're okay. Good boy, Anthony. All right. So he's 160 plus pounds. When the dogs dig in, so when Momo digs in, she's pulling in, she's digging in two to three times her body weight into the ground because she's got four by four dog traction, right? So, so she's able to pull in and dig into the ground. So at the most, she might be doing 50 pounds, five zero, 50, 60 pounds of pull. Still impossible for her to pull you. There he goes. Hi, Anthony. Right. It's impossible for her to pull you. It's impossible for her to pull your husband. Absolutely impossible. So don't let her pull you or your husband at all. Create a consistency between you and your husband. Pretend that you're taking care of, a, of your child when he was a, your, either of your sons when they were babies and you had to be consistent. You had to be consistent with your child. You your, Miki, really. You had to be consistent with your child, you and your husband. If you weren't consistent with your child, your child played both of you. Every child does that, right? It's normal. It's predacious nature of ours. It's survival. We think, oh, it's kind of cute. The dogs, uh, we think it's cute or we think our kid's really smart. It's not. It's just nature. It's natural for us to do that. Darwin, survival of the fittest. It's natural. How do we become predators? How do we become successful human beings in the evolutionary scale? It's natural. <laughs> so with, your, with, with Momo, you just have to be consistent. She can't be pulling you whatsoever. You can't be stopping for stuff. You can't be talking to her about everything either. Right? No more pulling, yeah, no more pull. no more, no more conversation with her other than you're going to talk to her like your husband would talk to her. So for those of you who have followed me, those of you who have worked with me, have hired, with, hired me, what I'm talking about today, because it's such a difficult structure to break through here, is different than what I've taught anybody who knows me. It, this is much different than what other people have heard. And same thing like today in the group session, who had a different method of approach with a, a dog and uh, their owner. They're, they're human because of a certain uniqueness of that conduct there. So, again, hey, guys, Anthony, no. Um, I have to clean his eyes. Here, clean your eyes, Anthony. Um, um, so, so just follow that pattern, right? So what we want to do is we want to create a consistency that's going on. Minky, we want to create a consistency that goes on. But the thing is because – it's hard to figure out what was exactly going on. Start structuring and patterning yourself after how your husband talks, but at the same time, walk slower. So there's, uh, the, you're welcome to, I haven't finished yet. Uh, uh, pattern yourself after your husband in that sense of conduct, you reducing the amount of conversation that you have. Okay, so, so even right here, stop it. I'm just holding him by his collar. Stop it. Okay, um, when, you, when she goes out there and she starts barking at everything, you're just going to give, watch that one about leash, right? Uh, buying the uh, psycho psychology of buying the right leash. Just watch that video and study it and pay attention to the part, right? It's on, it's on YouTube, so I'll, I'll put the link in here. Later on, you can watch it tomorrow. And just Understand what that psychology of the leash aspect. Oh, he got me right in the throat there. That kind of hurt a bit. <laughs> got me right in the larynx right there. Okay, stop. 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 Right? So you want to talk about the down training, taking the dog down. So this is what's going to happen. When he does that, because I'm sitting down at the height, I'm going to palm him down instead. Um, stop. 
Stop. Okay, both of you. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll put the link in there. When, you, when you're out walking with her, with Momo, and she started barking at everybody and everything, stop negotiating with her, right? Don't, don't negotiate with dysfunction. Oh, actually, yeah. I, I should put that on a T-shirt. Stop. Don't, don't negotiate with dysfunction. Holy cow, I'm getting warm here. A um, little bit of tough love. Kind of like how, again, like your husband in that sense. So what we're just doing is getting you to pattern yourself after your husband so that way there's a consistency within the home itself in regards to how the behavior is happening. Then it's also going to teach your, your dog, Momo, that your behavior, which is similar to your husband, means that the conduct that she's going to be feeling from you is going to be similar to what your husband is. That way we're creating a homogenous type of behavior on your end, right? So it's the humans that have screwed up, right? You, right? I'm just going to say it. You know me. So it's, it's, it's that part, the enablement that has happened, all this kind of stuff of feeding into her low self-esteem, her interdependency, which is kind of interesting because uh, I have somebody in the UK, a trainer out there that asked me <laughs> about a dog that's Velcro to them, always following them around, which is not the same as, as Momo. And what I call is non-modular interdependency. And the non-modular interdependency is the fact that the dog cannot survive without their human. And even though they're with their human, they don't really want to be with their human in the sense of, oh, I love you and, and, and love you and true love kind of behavior. It's like, I have to be with this human. And if my human was to disappear or yeah. surrender me or they died, I would be reactive to everybody else. So it's somewhat similar to what's going on. Well, you know, if I could do a t-shirt, I would. It's somewhat similar to, to, to this aspect with Momo, but it's not that bad. So we want her to have that bit of a modular, and I call that modular interdependency as well, which allows her to kind of glue into somebody else, glue into somebody else, glue into somebody else, who gives her the right amount of attention that satiates her low self-esteem and her dependency issues. But like I said, it's, she is a iceberg. Momo follows Dawn everywhere. She follows me to the bathroom. Um, I have also one about why dogs follow us into the bathroom as well. And I've had people who, were, who, who contact me and they're like, holy crap, that's uh, it's so simple. We thought, you know, we read all about this stuff and the thing, why the dog does it, blah, blah. And they're like, wow, that's um, simple. So, like I said, nothing I'm talking about is complicated whatsoever. And it's not meant to be complicated because dogs aren't complicated. They just, they love us absolutely and everything like that. Moment falls, yeah, moment falls everywhere. Okay. Um, okay, so... So that's where we're at with um, uh, that part. Out for the walks. Don't don't t over talk to her. Don't negotiate. Some dogs, depending on the behavior, they need to. Like, even in my skittish group today, I maintain a certain type of skittishness around the dogs today because of certain type of behaviors each dog and the human beings, the the the, the, the humans had as well. So I had to maintain a certain type of level, and then I adjusted it three different times. Um, and I changed tone and I and changed the envelope of it all. Oh, okay, so you have watched it then. Awesome, right? You just have to be firm. Don't be repetitive when you're telling her you're going to the bathroom, you're going to the bedroom, going to the kitchen, etc. Just don't be repetitive. Make it very clear. Don't try to convince her that, that you're going to just, I'm going to the bathroom. I'm in the bathroom. I'm leaving the bathroom. I'm in the kitchen. I'm leaving the kitchen. That's it. Nothing else, right? You got to have that change of tone of your voice. If you're patterning it against and the similar to your husband, then it's going to fall through. What I mean, again, is to make it homogenous throughout the whole home where the same conduct is the same. And because there's so much confusion with what your post was today, I'm just going to say, ask your, follow your husband because he's the one that's got somewhat of a foundation with her. When you're outside, walk that slow pace. Don't let her stop everywhere. You keep going, let her go pee once or twice or whatever, but don't let her pee 15 times. Don't let her sniff 300 times in 300 different spots. Like I've said before, the dog, the dog can hold their pee for four hours even. I can hold, you know, I've been on here for two hours, I can hold my pee. You can hold your pee for two hours. You've been watching for over two hours. No yelling. Yeah, both my husbands now say no yelling. It worked great, right? Just human language, conversational language and all that stuff. Uh, don't forget to share my post then, Sue. 
uh, for anybody out there watching, please share my stuff. It works 100% of the time, 100%. The, the, the barking out the window, that's something that someone will end up paying a, a, a trainer of behaviors to come in for 250 bucks to do, to tell you how to deal. And they would say, well, here's some treats, right? I've got the trainers who aren't doing that anymore. Like, you know, I'm just going to kind of start to integrate what you're saying in with my, my clients. And then they're, and they're like, yeah, my clients are happy with me now. Well, yeah, because they're like... What did you figure out? I was like, well, you know, I've been reading stuff. I'm like, I don't care. Just don't, as long as people aren't flaming me, as long as those people who say that they're my, you know, following me and doing stuff, don't go and backstab me. I'm totally cool. You, you can do whatever you want. Like that, that Sheila Begg from uh, Dizing K9 Academy just backstabbed me, but that's okay. That's okay. She backstabbed me. It's just, well, it's not okay. It's just uncool, unprofessional. It's just backstabbed me. Um, okay, so this comes to that part, right? So just you follow through all this stuff. It's all consistent. So you have the no yelling. You go to the bathroom. You palm the dog down, etc. Which she's not jumping on you anyways. Um, follow your husband's behavior, homogenous throughout the home. Going to the dog park and all that stuff. You've got to talk to her. Okay, Mary, you're so awesome because you. I always see you sharing my stuff. Okay, anyways, thank you, Mary. <laughs> thank you, Mary. You're so awesome. Like, I don't, yeah, I, thank you. Um, okay, guys, Minky, stop. Minky, stop. Come here. Up. No, no, Anthony. Come up. Okay, so this is Minky, the white-headed gender. Hello, Minky. Hello, Minky. Minky, Minky is from the, those videos and all stuff. There he is on the side. Minky is the one from the meat dog farm and the extremely skittish dog that was biting people for no reason right that's a, that's a that's a, uh, a a dysfunction the licking in the face that's a dysfunction oh mickey's looking at everybody hi mickey okay mickey okay so we're just gonna walk him down mickey down all right that's it right walk him down stop please stop um okay so just fall through that stuff when you go to the dog park just make sure that you're maintaining contact with her and you're not overly stop that you're not overly trying that you're not acting too nervous nelly around her just be consistent uh truth patient this says we are low income scene oh you're all oh. do you do you want the dog food then sue i mean do, uh, cat and dog food just let me know if you want the cat and dog food then you can come by uh, and, and pick it up i have someone coming by tomorrow Thank you, Sue. Uh, yeah, I have somebody coming by tomorrow around noon to pick up some cat food. So if you want cat food and dog food, you're welcome to come over and I'll, I'll find you some dog food here. Um, I feed raw, so it's different. Um, but yeah, cat food and dog food, I'd be happy to, uh, I, it's donated to me. So, you know, they're the guys, you know, like I say, I can, you know, sell it, but I'm not going to sell it because just for, for people like you, right? Um, <laughs> uh, um, I'll send you my, uh, I'm near Tinehead Park, so um, I'll send you my address through PM. Um, the dysfunction, Sammy, it, it, it's all dependent on what the dog is doing. And the same thing like when you come home and your dog's jumping on you and some people whose dogs jump at you start licking your face, right? That's that, that whole part of it. There's a, there's a whole host of reasons. It's all historical on the dog's behavior, right? That's why, like the stuff when it comes to Momo, I need all this information, but I'm not getting all this information, so it's hard to structure anything. And that's how I'm jumping all over the place and why I'm making wrong assumptions, right? I'm making mistakes in it because I don't know what's going because I start going to follow a certain structure, then new information comes out. And I'm like, well, that information would have helped me here, right? So that's why I said, and that's kind of why we went back like five times back and forth, and I kept deleting your post. And I said, you got to clear it up. You got to clear it up. You got to clear it up. It's not making sense. And, and, this is where we're at. So we're kind of stuck back a bit. Okay, sorry. I uh, Okay, Hank, I got I to gotta go, though, because uh, somebody just went and pee on the floor here. All right, guys, thank you so much. Be kind. Take care. Everyone, goodbye. And it's, yeah.